This is Tom Gardner on our third day in Tucson on a tape oral history project. Uh, with me right now is Dan Wynarski, who uh, uh, will tell us his history of including his involvement in tape products. Well, thank you very much. I'm Daniel Wynarski. I was born and raised in Toledo, Ohio, where not only was I born, but my wife Donna was born, and our parents were born. Um, went to elementary school in um, Kleiss Elementary in Point Place of Toledo, Ohio. About halfway through that, they shifted us to a new elementary school called um, Otter River. And it was at that time the Soviets were launching their Sputnik, and the teachers all looked at us and said, go into engineering. It's like, yes, <laughs> I will go into engineering. Uh, so my roots go way back. And I always enjoyed science back then. And it was on to, uh, from Point Place Junior High to Woodward High School, where um, my senior year, they wouldn't let me take three study halls. So they placed me in debate. And that's where I started dating Donna Robinson. And uh, we dated through college. She went to Adrian College in Adrian, Michigan, and I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. It seemed incredibly far away, but it was like an hour's drive. <laughs> um, and I studied, first I was in nuclear engineering. I thought, yes, I want to do something with nuclear physics. But then after a while, I saw some of these job ads and it's like, geez, you know, aerospace uh, could use mechanical, electrical. It's almost nobody wanted nuclear engineering, so I jumped ship to aerospace for about a semester. And then I thought, geez, you know, if there's ever a layoff in the aerospace industry, I'm really up for crick. So I went to something more general, and it was mechanical engineering. And then upon graduation, uh, I went into the 82nd Airborne Division for uh, just shy of two years and uh, Donna was my war bride. And uh, we were stationed at, um, it was an interesting story, you, you and uh, Tom, this Tom, you and I were both at Fort Belvoir for the engineer officer basic course at one time. What but, time were you there? Uh, I, I, see, like August to October of 1970. Mm -hmm. But um, it was at that time I went crazy and decided to go into the 82nd Airborne Division. My orders were for to go to Vietnam but I didn't know what I was doing. I just had this impulse one day, and as it was, the 82nd Airborne had just gotten back from Vietnam. And so it was like, wow, this is great. I'm stationed in the States. <laughs> um, on my um, third jump in, in um, uh, airborne training at Fort Benning, Georgia, I, I broke a bone in my uh, foot. And so there I am one day driving around Fort Benning uh, with my left foot, <laughs> my right foot slung over the passenger side, and the MP stopped me. And I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm, this isn't going to look very good. But they said, Sir, you're wearing your seatbelt, so we're going to give you $5. <laughs> 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 it was great. From there, then, was the 82nd Airborne, made 13 jumps, even one jump in Turkey, which was very interesting, very nice soft landing. After the Army went back to, uh, for four months to Libby Owens Ford, uh, Glass Company Company sadly no longer exists in Toledo, Ohio, where I did mechanical engineering. And it was from there off to the University of Colorado, where I got my master's degree in mechanics and saw the IBM plant site for the first time. Thought, wow, what a great place to work. And then uh, by then, Donna was expecting. We went on to the back to the University of Michigan for me to get my doctorate, where I studied below the knee amputees. So I did a lot of work in dynamics and force measurement. And some of that actually uh, worked out for IBM. But it was after that, there were no jobs. And sadly, IBM wasn't hiring. So I actually spent a year with Exxon Production Research in Houston. And um, it was like miserable near the end. That, it would take almost an hour to drive to seven miles to get into Exxon. So when one day I saw this IBM customer engineer and I'm going, hey, it's not too late to try IBM again. And so a, a John, Dr. John Harris uh, decided to interview me and I remember talking to Harley Oppobone and Jack Wells and, and uh, Dave Norton. And uh, so 
There I was, hired on to IBM. And uh, it was a glorious time when we drove into Boulder. Uh, we, we, were we were told the move might be coming, but not for three to five years, and we could stay in Boulder forever. And then two months later, it's like, well, we're going to Tucson. This, this is 78 or 79? I'm sorry, 1977. So, um, and, and it probably worked out the, for the best to be one of the first, if not the first group to move down to Tucson. So we were able to get uh, uh, an affordable home. Um, and we were at the grand building at first. Uh, this, this grand building, but I think was like an abandoned like department store or something and on the near the airport. And so it was like, uh, uh, what am I doing here? <laughs> but there was a funny story from that. I'm sort of d d divulging from my uh, biography. But um, Scott Graham and I were testing the, what was then the Pegasus media for inner layer slip. And we were trying to decide what sort of hub might be best for the, t the tape reel. So there we are in an environmental chamber at 95 degrees Fahrenheit and like 90% humidity or something. It was just miserable. So we were, if you might imagine, we were in our gym shorts. So Mr. Wells brings in a customer and we were behind the table like this. <laughs> so all you could see were naked legs and naked torsos and arms. So he goes, <gasps> <laughs> quick, quick excuses himself because of naked people in the chamber. But uh, so it, it felt like heaven on earth when we got to move to the airport site. Um, that was a huge step up, and that was about in 79 maybe. And it, it took a while for us to get to the main site, even though the main site was um, uh, inaugurated or whatever, 1980. But yeah, then we find out the main side was really great. Um, in parallel with IBM, I kept my Army Reserve career going. <clears throat> and so um, um, I did my first tour of duty at the Corps of Engin Engineers Research Lab in Champaign, Illinois. And it was at that point I met um, Bill Chow, doc Dr. Bill Chow, who had gotten his PhD at the University of Michigan in the same area I had. He had studied um, gel and how to use uh, sculptured gels to lessen bed sores. And uh, I was thinking, man, I'd really like to come to the University of or Champaign-Urbana University. So I was all pumped to talk to him about academic life. And he was all pumped to talk to me about um, IBM. So before you know it, he's had his interview trip. And I remember taking him and his wife, Catherine, through the uh, Sorrel uh, National Park uh, the eight mile loop in the evening and we got to see mule deer and of course they fell in love with Tucson and so they were hired by IBM. Um, did other tours of duty but finally it was in um, 1980 so I actually missed the um, inauguration of the the, um, uh, the main site for IBM. Uh, my wife and son got to 10 but um, we, um, I had seen at Fort Belvoir, I made a summer tour to Fort Belvoir looking for a home in the Army because I'm like, mm, if this is going to work, i got to find something better than just doing little assignments here and there. And somebody said, uh, well, you probably ought to get a new ID card because yours is like expired. <laughs> so, so I show up to the ID place and there's this other second lieutenant with his um, badge and underneath it, his name was United States Military Academy instructor. And I'm going, Wow, how did you get that? Well, you just send them your resume. So, duh, I sent them my resume, and that's how I spent almost all of my military career then teaching at the Department of Mechanics uh, in, in Civil and Mechanical Engineering at the University of, I'm sorry, the West Point Military Academy. And um, so um, it was interesting that that was a fun career. Uh, do I, my three courses that I taught would be um, Strength and Materials, which I liked vibrations, which I just loved. And it must have been a mental block, but I also had to do statics and dynamics. And there's something about that course that's like, no, not more dynamics. <laughs> but um, so um, here it is after 1999, after uh, great times at West Point, being able to see fall foliage um, going up in the springtime into Vermont, seeing the uh, sugaring off of the, the maple sh syrup. Um, Hurricane Floyd comes, and, and we remember watching, my, my wife came with me for my very last tour, and Hurricane Floyd was gonna like really smack into Florida. And somehow like this opposing wall of weather 
came to the Florida coast and just stalled the hurricane for a couple of days. It's like, well, that's interesting. And then finally, Floyd starts heading with the bee line to New York. And so there we are. Um, we're quick grabbing candles and matches. We're eating really quick because the power has gone out. We know if we don't eat like right now, there's not going to be any food for a long time. Um, and it was just a torrential downpour that Friday evening of my uh, Army Reserve tours are like normally two weeks long, so it's like Friday and then over the weekend the hurricane struck. So duly Saturday morning at the hotel there, the workers painted the hallways and I mean the, the stairways and the elevators were off, so all you everywhere you went, you had paint on your hands, paint on your shoes, <laughs> paint on the carpeting. But um, it, it was real nice. I, I really miss Army Reserves. That was fun. Um, our son was born in Ann Arbor during my doctorate, and um, he, so he he was thrilled with Boulder and enjoyed coming to Tucson and. Um, I got a lot of inventions through IBM, through the Invention Disclosure Program, so I wanted to sincerely thank IBM for that. And Bob Friesen, who was the Site General Manager, and he, I'm not sure how this happened, but he got the idea of having me come in for a number of times with my family, and um, he would hand the uh, check to Donna, the plaque to me, and give me a few good words, and, and then you know send us on. Well, our son loved the, the office of Bob Friesen. He's going, oh, inventions, money, plaques. So intellectual property must be a good thing to do. So he ended up getting his um, bachelor's degree um, at the University of Colorado. So he got to go back to, to Boulder for a while. <coughs> that was like um, 91 to 95. And then uh, he went on to law school and became a patent attorney. At the same time he was becoming a patent attorney, uh, I said, geez, may, uh, maybe we ought to take the patent agent exam, because that's, that's a formal bar exam, patent bar exam you have to take. And engineers can take it. You just become a patent agent rather than a patent attorney. So one night, it's, it's um, like it's about, he's about halfway through law school. And uh, so we've been waiting and waiting for our exams. It was, we took the exam, it was the, ended up being the last exam, which was hand graded and hand filled out. You had to write everything down in, in longhand. And so it took a long time to grade. So finally, and, oh, and our car had died. So we're looking around Tucson for a new car. We couldn't find anything. So it's, Christmas, it's, it's um, Valentine's Day, we got home hungry, it's late, we're tired, grumpy because we couldn't find a, a car. And then um, <coughs> go to the mailbox, and there's this real thin envelope for our son and a real thick one for me. So I mistakenly thought I passed. Well, it turns out he got the thin letter saying, yay, you passed, you're done. And I flunked. <laughs> so here we are on the phone. He's going, wow, I can't believe I passed. And I'm crying, going, oh my gosh, I got to do this again. So I did pass on the second time, but that's certainly a memorable thing. But we owe it all very much to IBM and Mr. Friesen for giving our son kind of a look ahead to what his career could be. And he works now in Mountain View for Intellectual Ventures, not far from the Computer Museum. Um, Donna here was a, in Tucson, was a substitute teacher for many years, and she taught at some 28 different schools on a part-time basis as a, as a librarian, so she enjoyed that very much. Now, she's retired from that, and um, I retired from IBM, so to speak, in 2013, two years ago, and uh, then a few days later came back as a contractor, so now I work uh, doing the same thing I did when I left IBM, as um, an open source software. So all those computer licenses nobody wants to read, that's what I help build. <laughs> In between the open source software and working on tape, I did work um, with Andy Bidet in the optical area, and that was a lot of fun. And there were certain similarities between an optical library and a tape library. So there was some transference of skills from one project to another. Um, and then that was like roughly nine, 88 to 94, and then in 1994 there, there were strong rumors of layoffs that IBM wasn't doing very well and something had to go, and as I recall the optical sales weren't that great. So um, I, wore, I suggested to my son that he get his mother a um, University of Colorado nightshirt. I thought, you know, that might be fun for her to get. So he ended up getting a triple X large, like football jersey. <laughs> 
<laughs> that, okay, well, with layoffs coming, I'm going to wear that. And I wore, you know, usually IBM was the white, white shirt and tie and wingtips and everything. So I'm showing up to work in, in shorts and then in this triple X a large uh, football jersey, which you couldn't even tell I was wearing shorts, I went down to my knees. And this Dr. Vic Gibson, who is our functional manager in optics, says, uh, Dan, there's somebody who's going to interview today for a job, take it. It's like, oh, okay, I wish I would have known about this sooner. <laughs> but that's why I inter was interviewed by a, a Joanne Mamola Williams to do um, patent licensing. And that uh, also tied in then with our son being a patent attorney. He saw me doing all these trips around the world and licensing IBM patents, so that helped him make his career decisions. And I did that to about 2007 um, in this patent licensing, so roughly about 12, 13 years. And then, uh, the, the, as you imagine, things changed within IBM. They took all of the patent licensing groups and the various divisions and coalesced them into uh, corporate. And so then I was briefly, for a while, but not doing patent licensing, I was doing like technology transfer. And I, well, frankly, wasn't very good at that. So especially, and you can imagine that the, uh, like in, in Tucson, the, um, the tape area wasn't anxious to sell off its technology to like Oracle, because <laughs> we'd lose our marketing edge. So I um, thought, well, maybe I can invent my way into some sort of te palatable technology that IBM would let me license. So, so in the, when, when the end came to my um, being in, um, this technology licensing area, I was working on trying to use IBM's giant magnetoresistive heads and nanoparticle tagged antibodies to detect cancer. And a number of patents came out of that. And, well, frankly, my management at the time was ready to fire me because don't do that, Dan. We want you to concentrate on core things. I'm going, well, yeah, but nobody wants to sell the core things because they're core. We have to think outside of the box, but yet, use technologies that IBM's familiar with, like GMR heads, and, you know, nanoparticles, like it's used in Rick Bradshaw's tape. So, um, but now they're frantically, and those patent applications that I filed in 2009, which was, by the way, at the time I joined open source, I was sort of like given the opportunity to either leave IBM or do open source. I'm going, open source sounds like a great plan. <laughs> but, but, the, but IBM went ahead and, and, and filed for patent, applica patent applications um, back in 2009, and they're still dividing up those patents that IBM is now getting more into the medical area, and maybe it's more medical records than medical technology, but yeah, they're excited about it, and so the, I just signed off on, the, I think it was three divisionals just like a month ago. So, so those, those, the, the medical area with the IBM still lives. So, um, open source in the sense of open source software? Yes, open source software, yes. So IBM, it's funny, it, it, like back in, hearkening back to the old days where IBM wrote its own MVS system and that, now everybody grabs, or most everybody grabs stuff off the internet. It's like you go to, to internet's a giant like, uh, discount store and you just grab things here and there. And then the, you, the programmers maybe in certain ways are more of system integrators. They'll take these various diverse packages and link them together into uh, working modules. Now, it depends on the program. Some programs at IBM, like the DS8000, use some open source, but it's mostly homegrown software. And other programs are almost entirely open, open source software. So are you writing open source or requiring open source or licensing? I'm not requiring it, no, but it's, it's, a, it's like market. It, market driven within IBM, and I'm sure other companies too, rather than having to develop your own program, you say, well, OpenSSL does that for me, I'll grab it, and just and just stuff it into what I'm trying, to, my project, what I'm trying to do. So, so you're doing software projects op using open source? Right, okay. right. And the projects are in the area of? Well, uh, one of them is like XIV in Israel. Uh, that was an IBM acquisition, and th so they've got their, their Linux, um, kernel and um, they're they're all the, the, and then the Linux user space and then there's other open source 
programs on top of that. And then finally, there's some of their own icing on the cake, so to speak. And that's just one example. There's been SONAS, um, SAN volume controllers, big user of open source, uh, tape projects, the uh, uh, tape libraries, um, um, yeah, yeah, even the tape drives themselves, the LTO is using open source. So, so you've made the transition from a mechanical designer, mechanical manager to a, to a programmer? Is that well, the... a partial programmer. What I do is I'm more like an umpire in the ballpark. Okay. Um, I look at what the programs are using and then I scan it with a, a scan tool and go through, and then if you will, scan tool is not perfect. Sometimes it's better just to do it manually and you dig out all the licenses. And sometimes they'll sneak something in there which they shouldn't. It's like, okay, you've got a GPL license package here which is interfacing with the IBM proprietary code and there's, there's something called a viral effect that anything that you're the, the, the IBM proprietary code or anybody else's code that touches this or, or links to this GPL license code now becomes available to anyone who asks for it. So what we try to do is to say, all right, we find alternatives. So I, I'm not so much a programmer per se as much as say, oh, but I can find this alternative package for you. Why don't you try that? And this BSD license instead of GPL. So we work with the various programs to try to put a firewall up between the GPL code. And, and that, but then if it's like the GPL code's going inside the Linux kernel, well that's fine, it basically has to be GPL. So a lot of that, so we, then we go through the attorney justifications to use this code, and then there's, um, then we have to create the license, which, which which is like a labor of love. It's like reading the phone book. <laughs> Can I say it's like, oh. <laughs> now, fortunately, IBM's gotten more into the soft copy licenses and CDs. When I first started this job in 2009, there were a lot of hard copy licenses, and those were enormous. <laughs> so technology has moved on. Okay. So now, you, amongst your many patents, uh, is the patent, I believe, uh, on the tape handling mechanism of the uh, 3480, is that correct? Um, well, I had, a, 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 like, as I recall, four pants on the 3480. Uh, one of them was on the uh, tape cartridge, mm -hmm. and that actually grew out of the take, my work on the take-up reel. The take-up reel had to uh, have a, a, sl net, a slot in it so that the leader block from the tape cartridge could seat, and then you turn, move, move the take-up reel to bring the spool tape off of the tape cartridge. and. Um, I'm sorry. Well, we, we'll go into a lot of detail, I hope, on the on the um, how the tape mechanism works. Oh, sure. Later but today. I was just going to say, uh, but so we had to do something to the take up reel to make it work, and it's like we can do the same thing to the leader block of the tape cartridge. So it's sort of like a backwards evolution, so to speak, mm -hmm. that it was a, a serendipity, an unintended consequence of working on the take-up reel, that all of a sudden we've got something to work on the tape cartridge. That's, that's one of your th four, the other three? Oh, no, that's actually two, two. of the four. Okay. Um, uh, because one was for the take-up reel, and then the other for the tape cartridge, and then one was on the, um, the, the, the Pegasus tape, now, the, you were talking about stallion tape earlier, but, and I'm not sure where stallion and Pegasus all came together, but Pegasus tape was a thicker tape, as I recall, 1.6 thousandths of an inch, um, and it had a back coat. And I'm thinking, well, carbon back coat, I wonder if that doesn't absorb water. And, and, and it did, so what we would do is, and we would stress test the tape, by, we'd wind the tape at um, high temperature and humidity, and then we plunge the temperature in the uh, environmental chamber, and, and th th sure enough, you could get inner layer slip, which would mean that the reel wouldn't rotate as a disc. It's the outer part would just sort of stay there. And so we came up with a test, and, and true, as the tape then improved, the test probably, and I forget exactly when they probably took it out of the microcode, but at first, what you would do is you would actually cinch the tape against the leader block before you'd actually thread the tape hat, and if there was slippage, you'd know, aha, you just have to rewind the tape, and then when the tape was rewound, then everything was fine. That's your third pet? Uh-huh, and then the fourth one actually grew out of West Point. So there I am at West Point, and I'm learning force, acceleration, and okay, it is, it, because even though I had my doctorate by then, 
Uh, it was a requirement to teach at West Point, as you might imagine. But um, just to see this stuff all over again is like, wow, it's like I'm, I'm back, to the, back in school for the first time. And so, okay, so force, acceleration, and impulse momentum, uh, that's what I worked on my, my first tour of duty. And then at West Point in 1980, and I get back to IBM, and they said, Dan, we want to have a way of detecting a tape cartridge which only had like, and I forget exactly the amount, but like half the amount of tape. They wanted a mini tape cartridge, so to speak. And I say, oh, I know how to do that, because I just learned that at West Point. So what we did is we just put in a little impulse to the motor in the unwind direction and unwound the tape, but only like a few degrees of motion. And you could tell by the duration of that whether or not it was a full reel, which hardly moved, or a half reel, which moved more. And so I go back to West Point and I tell them, wow, oh, look what I did. And they're going, oh, we don't think so. We don't believe you. And it's like, yes, yes. <laughs> this, this stuff, it, it was imminently practical what we're teaching here. Uh, forgive me if uh, you're, I'm asking something that you already said, but turn, going way back now to your, your wife, her parents were from? Oh, Toledo, Ohio as well. So uh -huh. the entire family is a Midwestern yeah, family, we're all very Midwestern. Now, uh, my grandparents, um, my, my, I remember my grandfather, he actually came from Poland. So, and just, he came a few years just before World War I broke out. So he, he was a lucky guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he met my grandmother in what was called now a Polish village in Toledo, Ohio. It was Bronson Street. Uh, near, in fact, they, they lived near Bronson and Warsaw. I mean, how much more Polish can you get? remember my grandmother telling me that you want to learn Polish, um, you get a job at the little grocery store at the corner of Warsaw and Bronson. And you know, grocery stores now are nothing like they were back then. And this one is even small to begin with. It was like somebody took the, the, the tiny living room of their home and made it into a little grocery store. There might be a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of cans. That was all there was. Mm -hmm. but, um, so, um, it, but it was interesting that Poland didn't exist before World War I, so to speak. It was divided up between Austria, Russia, and Germany. And so when the Russians launched their Sputnik I, and I remember um, them counting down in Russian, going, wow, I gotta learn Russian. So I asked my, my dad's father about this, and he was able to teach me. And I remember it, Dva Odin, like for that would be two, one. Uh, and I don't remember much more than that, but <laughs> that was back like 60 years ago, but, or, or yeah, about that, 55 years ago. But if you ever watched the movie, um, oh, I have to think of its name now. It's uh, this submarine movie where the, the satellite is, ca uh, the Russians, uh, we, we launch a satellite and the Russians take it over and take all these pictures of our bases. And, and it's, it's um, and the satellite lands in the Arctic. But then they have the beginning of the movie show the same types of computers being used by Russians and Americans, and they're both counting, be it Russian or English, and I could actually understand just maybe two or three of the numbers, but it's like. That's both sets of your grandparents are from Warsaw area? Um, no, my, my mother's parents, um, well, he, I never met her father. He was in the coal mines of West Virginia and died of black lung disease, so I only knew my, her, her stepfather. He was actually in the Spanish-American war and was bayoneted, so he, got, he showed me a scar probably one time. And uh, um, but my mother spoke of them being uh, part Ukrainian. In fact, one of our rel distance relatives, in court, the records are gone now, but was, was a Cossack. So there's some Russian in there too, I guess. Mm -hmm. And how about your wife's side? Did she have shared any of that with you? Uh huh. That uh, we know more, much more about her parents. Her, uh, I mean, her grandparents and great grandparents. We have um, um, uh, uncle. No, I'm, I'm, she's going to murder me for not remembering their names. But it's Herman Hinkleman. That's right. And his, it's like great grandparents. And they, they hang their pictures hang in them. Um, our, our living room. Uh, they were from uh, Germany, and uh, we have their immigration papers when they swore away the Kaiser of Germany and were agreeing to become U.S. citizens. Great. And she's also part Scotch. And um, there's a, 
reading in some ink books about people in England, some of them have a characteristic like little white flash of hair or white. It, and she had that. Now, now it's mostly white. In, <laughs> but we'll edit that out of the uh, oh, that's okay. tape. Uh, oh, it's interesting. That, uh, okay, go ahead. Now, uh, and if you want to say more about your family background, that's great. But I was well, going to step on to. Uh, well, please, if you have more to say, please say it. No. Um, no, I guess that's all. Oh, hey, her brother proudly served in the Marines. There you go. And so, uh, again, I apologize if I'm repeating, uh, but did you say how you decided to become a mechanical engineer? Well, that's a good question. Um, um, uh, the, the going back to the University of Michigan, I, and I loved high school physics, and it's all about, and I remember nuclear physics and neutrons, protons, electrons, I'm going, that's what I really want to study. So I went off into nuclear engineering, but it was not really a department, it was more of a curriculum, and you go in there, it's like a little office with uh, two professors, and I'm going, oh, I don't have a good, uh, good feeling about getting a job when I'm through with this. So I went into aerospace, and um, that was about like 1967, that's my sophomore year, and um, that was not long after Chuck Yeager's big spiral where he, his, his jet plane went out of control like at 100,000 feet and he spiraled down to 40,000 feet. So, and when the invention was that the, uh, to make a, a fighter craft supersonic, they had to go into like a wasp wing to shrink down the center of the body because the area of the wings was like a block. So if you shrink down the diameter of the plane at that point, the plane could sustainably go beyond the speed of sound. I'm like, well, you know, that's all very interesting, but just looking at the job uh, things, it's like if you were going to be in aerospace, they also hired mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and all sorts of other engineers. So I'm thinking, geez, mechanical sounds more versatile. We're essentially studying the same things, well, not exactly per se. I mean, we didn't, in, as a mechanical engineer, didn't study wing shapes and angle of attacks, but I still took fluids, and I still took structures and dynamics. So, and I figured if I were to go into aerospace, maybe mechanical engineer were a safer bet because I could go into other areas as well, not just aerospace. So that's how it all began with um, Professor Quackenbush at the University of Michigan. So I still remember him. And uh, um, I had finished up at the University of Michigan and was off in the Army. We visited one time briefly. And I somehow, well, not somehow, but there was this um, mechan a Pi Tau Sigma, an honorary uh, uh, for, for mechanical engineers. And Professor Quackenbush, whose desk was heaped up with paper, to, he, he knew, he sort of said, oh, Dan, I think I know where your certificate is. And he sort of dug over on the left corner of his desk and he sort of feel, felt around and he was able to pull it out. It was just seemed like an impossible, unorganized mess of just papers heaped up there, but he knew exactly where it was. So any more background information you'd like to share with us or well, anything sure. I didn't ask you about? Sure, just from a military standpoint, in addition to my wife's brother having been in the Marines, my dad was in the Normandy invasion. He was in uh, LST-60, so he landed wow. Patton tan Patton's tanks at Utah Beach. Utah Beach. Uh huh. Have you been to Normandy? No, never have, but I think that would be a good thing. We've been to France, but no, we haven't yeah. been to Normandy yet. Uh, I personally highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. and, and sure, uh, a must do. Um, uh, near the or after finishing my uh, army career, because the army lets you stay in only so long, it's up or out. And I made it to lieutenant colonel, which was better than I ever thought. But in 1999, I was politely retired at great retirement ceremony, and was on the heels of that Hurricane Floyd that I mentioned earlier. And I really missed teaching. Didn't really see it as a career, but then a few years later, the uh, Native American Diversity Network at IBM. Uh, said, Dan, we need teachers. We're going out to the Tohono O'odham Community College, and uh, we we need people. So Don and I showed up for that, and we became very much involved with the Native American community, uh, teaching a, a lot at the Pasquayaki Intel Clubhouse, um, Tohono O'odham's um, uh, high school in cells, 
And uh, the last four years, I was able to mentor students to go to all the way to the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, um, mostly with solar projects. So that was a lot of fun. It is, again, today, Wednesday. We're here in Tucson at West Press conducting uh, a series of oral histories on uh, the history of tape with focus on the 3480 tape drive. Uh, today's session is intended to be uh, mainly about the, the mechanism, the drive itself. Um, and we now have uh, Dan back with us, but we have uh, added John, who graciously gave the Computer History Museum a plug yesterday and to show his enthusiasm, joined us today wearing a t-shirt. In addition <coughs> to John and Dan, we have Andy as our panel. Uh, so we did yesterday spend a little bit of time on, the, on vacuum columns in general as buffers, either electrical or mechanical, depending upon your background. Uh, and of course, there was much discussion over the last two days over how the um, mechanism itself, beyond the, the technology to tape, the mechanism itself had a number of innovations um, to uh, improve our reliability, accuracy, performance. Uh, and that's really the subject today. Uh, Dan, can you sort of walk us through, in your view, the difference between a uh, conventional reel-to-reel uh, -reel vacuum tube mechanism and the mechanism that wound up guiding the tape to the head uh, and to the take-up reel in the 3480. Okay, the, um, the thir IBM 3420 used a pair of vacuum columns which decoupled the 10 and a half inch reels uh, and so you, the 10 and a half inch reels would have to move eventually but in order to make a rapid motion of the tape, you only had to change the vacuum a little bit, or, or, or no, I'm sorry, not change the vacuum. There was a little like spindle motor which would move the tape across the head. So you actually had very little moving mass um, as opposed to the, the revolutionary uh, 3480 where now we're going to move the reels in unison. So you had a lot more mass to move and so the tension control was very critical as well as the motion control of the tape. Uh, you had to control big masses as opposed to just a little bit of tape going across the head. So there was a, a big jump there and the, as I recall the first person who worked out the um, block diagram algebra for a reel-to-reel -reel servo was John Ide in IBM San Jose and that was back around 1977 and um, then um, he transferred that knowledge to me when I was sent out. I, I joined IBM on a Monday morning, and by Monday afternoon, this one manager was looking at me like a, hmm. <laughs> and so they actually wanted me to fly to IBM San Jose from Boulder at 5 o'clock that day. I'm going, oh, I don't have any tickets. I don't have any luggage. I don't have any reservations. I'm just going to, like, show up <laughs> at the airport. So I begged, I begged them off, and so finally, it was the following week I went out. But it was then, then we had a very uh, long tour. That's where I met John Ike, and then the person who did the very first pneumatic tension transducer, which became part of the 3480 tape drive. Although at this point, he did it, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but uh, he did, it was a three-pronged tension transducer where the tape would come in, wrap around, and the, the, there was a little solid state pressure sensor in the center of this and it was pressure, the tape, the pressure exerted um, on the, uh, by the tape was its function of its tape tension divided by radius of the wrap and the width of the tape. So um, at that point it was only instrumentation but then Tom Osterdays and others then made that into an actual physical part of the tape path. So that, that, so in addition, so you had to have tension control, making sure that the reels were opposed to each other so that the tape would lay against the head. At the same time, the tapes had to rotate in unison to keep the tape moving across the head. And um, then you had this tension transducer to measure the tape tension to ensure that the, the tension was within a reasonable uh, spec. Um, and the, the, the one motor had a fine tachometer, as I recall, like 500 lines, and then the take-up reel was a single-line tachometer to count revolutions. 
So the entire servo system is totally different from that of a um, uh, the, the vacuum column tape drive. It was certainly a big leap for IBM. Uh, did anybody have anything to add? Or? No, we talked about it a little bit yesterday. That's pretty much the uh, same thing we said. I <clears throat> Maybe a slight variation. The tension and velocity control derived from the tax, which gave you the radius estimates of two reels. You, you could pretty much open loop uh, control velocity and tension. Like Dan said, you always had a torque, opposing torque differential between the two motors to maintain the tension. And when you were accelerating, you would increase torque here and decrease torque here, but you always maintain this differential. And my recollection was only slightly different. I, I recall that the tension transducer was kind of put in, really not from time zero to control transients events more than uh, steady state, but I could be wrong. Oh, no, uh, it, it didn't, when, forgive me, when did you hire on IBM? 1978. Wow, so just, it seemed like a year. <laughs> did, didn't I interview you? Uh, you might have. <laughs> I have to forget. <laughs> you can so, never forget Dan. <laughs> so, so we can back up, I, I was very uh, uh, impressed by Dan's biography. Dan was one of the first people I met in IBM. I remember him, even if he doesn't remember oh, me. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I remember, I think you were working for a guy named Dave McMurtry. Yes. And who worked for a guy named Dave Norton. Yeah. Yep. And I was kind of on the technology tower. Dan was on the product tower with Joel and others. And we had some interaction because the, uh, we talked at some length yesterday about what the impact of getting rid of the vacuum columns caused. And there were just a number of ripple down things and uh, you put it in your own words where we had so much more mass to deal with and instead of that rubberized cap stand with oh, a right. vacuum in it which is all you were spinning in uh, 3420. But my recollection is that uh, the Saguaro deck or whatever it was called at the time, uh, we started with an assumption of no pneumatics. Correct. And. Uh, so that was one of the things we talked about yesterday. What, what was assumed, and, and then later, what happened? Uh, <laughs> what oh, happened? yeah, that's a good point. And I remember one of the things is I designed the uh, the air bearings. The uh, I remember handing you a little bitty piece of paper that yeah, said I remember ten, that. 10 mil holes and 100 mil centers, yes. 150 mils from yes. the end. <laughs> that's right. I was that very was all there was to it. No, no, it was important because yeah, originally. The 3480 was called Intrepid. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, and Intrepid had, in fact, the, 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 as I recall, John I did the basic design, and he was an electrical engineer, so he did all of this servo work, which is invaluable. But then, for he, the, and maybe other people helped him, but, but from, from a tape standpoint, he said, well, we're going to use fixed tape guides separated roughly about six inches. And so you, they need to be separated that much to control the skew of the tape. Um, but, uh, the, the, and they would be open channel guides, but there would be enough tolerance there so that this rigid beam of tape wouldn't go off track. Well, as we all know, a tape is an elastic member, it's not rigid. So it took us a long time to figure out that that design wasn't going to work. We tried moving the, these, these open channel guides closer in, of course then the skew went crazy, and then the fur, but we, we were able to control lateral motion better, and then it, we moved them further apart. But then, uh, so skew is better, but the tape would go crazy from a lateral standpoint. So that's when um, we threw up our hands and we, we went with Akatio. And Akatio was the, had air bearings, but Akatio had, so we were evolving. We knew, we knew we needed pneumatics back. Now true LTO then got away from pneumatics, but at the point we were, we were like desperate. We knew that the open channel guides weren't going to work. And so it's like, well, the at massive, the MSS, the 3850, used air bearing guides. So it's like, well, geez, maybe they knew what they were doing, so we're going to try that. So we, we, we actually tried bigger D bearings and the smaller D bearings. And the smaller D bearings with the head positioned opposite the D bearings, so the tape kind of wove in and around the D bearings, performed better than the, than the what eventually became part of the 3480, where you had these bigger D bearings in the head. <coughs> Um, but it turned out it was impractical to thread the thing 
the, the threader was designed and the, things, the particles were just showered down, so we had to eventually change the design from Akatillo to what became Saguaro. And so I was with the big D bearings, and, and that, that we were getting close now to the final design. Yeah, just we a, talked yesterday just about a, how we flipped the head back and forth a couple times, yes. and we had the, uh, choo -choo, the uh, laugh track uh, oh, thrown yeah. over it. And, yeah. I would like to make, uh, talk about amplifying the word skew, because it is uh, something that's somewhat unique to tape. And when you've got 18 tracks or whatever across the width of this tape, and it's interchanging between heads. Some heads might be tilted a little this way and other heads might be tilted a little that way. In 3420, there was a skew buffer as we know it today didn't exist. So they actually had something called skew tapes. So that was a master gold tape and you'd stick that tape in there and you'd look at the timing of the top track and the bottom track and adjust the head so that all the tolerances were contained for skew. 3480, we had some skew buffer, not a lot. As Dan said, it, there were still some constraints over how you had to control really all six degrees of freedom, as it turns out, and they all have their own kind of story. But of course, uh, this concept of skew, because it's multi-track, doesn't exist in disc. So that's a term that's uh, really a take. Uh-huh. You, you mentioned, uh Dan, the term D-bearing, is that what they Oh, that's what we called the air bearings because they were D-shaped. They had the curved yeah. outer track and then because uh, there was limited space on the tape path, we had to cut off, but you know, we could have had big circles, but we had to cut it off somewhere to make room for other things, so it was D-shaped. Yeah, I don't see something here to simulate it, but this is a head. You're looking at the end view, the tape is going like this. And these D bearings were two large bearings that sat on either side of the head, but of course it's a truncated cylinder. Mm -hmm. So imagine that this is gone, something like that on either side. And uh, that was mounted on a casting known as the head guide through. So these are the D bearings, the head, and all of the critical alignments of the head were relative to that casting as a base and those two D bearings, including the penetration, the wrap, the uh, Azimuth, the uh, skew, uh, was all had to be fairly well controlled. But we did have the luxury of having a, uh, one of the things we talked about, Dan, was that we didn't have a data buffer in 3420, so the tape drive had to be ready to rock and roll at all times, and when that data came, it, yep. the only place to put it was on the advent of electronics and, and the evolution of electronics allowed us to have a modest data buffer on 3480, so it was okay to have that reduced acceleration and take right. the positioning time. Uh, we also had the skew buffer that's relieved some of the uh, tolerances, on, and, and skew tapes kind of went the way of yeah. wherever they go, the history museum, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm kind of just bridging some oh, of the no, other sure. history I've already had. So, so the deep bearings were initially not pressurized. Though. There was no air in the path. That, that was one of the assumptions that it was one of the assumptions did not and, and pan it didn't out. work. And, and, and you know what? We, we tried it. We tried hard. It didn't work. We put air back in the system. Then we found out, oh, now that we have air in the system, we've got three other reasons why we need it. That's right. Uh, let's put a vacuum on a cleaner blade. Let's uh, stick a, head, a tape lifter in the middle of the head. That's right. <laughs> so, so it turns out we really did need it. Yeah. And we didn't learn a darn thing from that experience because the, the next follow-on after we shipped 3480 was a project called Barrel. Yes. Where we made every single mistake we made in Intrepid all over again with a new group of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was known in Addicts and it failed. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, actually, for maybe Dan's benefit, I think yesterday we sort of uh, came up with this assumptions that came from Boulder to Tucson. Uh, about the product, it was fun, certainly a fundamentally a major improvement in unscheduled instances and scheduled instances that the product would not require cleaning, the head would last forever. Um, I mean, in I, IBM's terms, as I understand it, UI and SI are the... DUI, duration. Oh, well, that's DUI. Yeah. UI is the incident duration, yeah. DUI is right. the duration. Right. Uh, you know, these are, since IBM uh, typically maintains the product. These are very f important financial numbers, and the objective then was, in, you know, push that football way down the field. To, to use, to paraphrase my friend John, 
Uh, and then taking out pneumatics would be one way of doing oh, that, yes. right? It, it, pneumatics are not as reliable as other things. So it was a major improvement in the reliability, maintainability of the product to use, to use uh, commercial. It was a fundamental decision for uh, chrome dioxide, the yes. particle type. Uh, I guess underlying that, we went through a lot with uh, uh, Rick. Rick on uh, the formulation was going to be the same as currently being used in the MSS, and that turned out to lead to bunches right. of changes. But it was fundamentally chrome uh, dioxide was throughout <laughs> magneto-resistant heads and conductive reader, uh, writers, um, 160 megabyte uh, cartridge, 160 megabyte capacity because that had to to uh, translate. So the old reel to reels could be filled, would could be written to yeah. the cartridge. Wasn't it 200 megabytes? Yeah, I, thought, I remember two. It well, shipped at 200, okay. but the initial requirement was, was 160. 160. Yeah. Ah. And if you recall, during the course of the uh, six-year war, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we upped the loader density a little bit. We mm -hmm. made the tape a little bit thinner. At yeah, some that point. thinner tape helped. Um, yeah, yep. And and we came up. We ended up shipping 200 megabytes, but from a you know, what did we inherit in 1978 yeah. when we all landed to do this thing was, okay, you're not going to have any vacuum columns. Right. It's going to be a significant improvement in its uh, reliability and maintainability, uh, hopefully reduced cleaning requirements because 3420 was kind of a pig that had to be cleaned every day. Uh, we assumed a thin film right head. We assumed a magnetoresistive read sensor so that we could operate at a lower velocity so that now the signal amplitude was velocity independent. Uh, Tom had a list, and, and kind of the, bridge, the gap we were bridging yesterday was the impact all of those assumptions had on the universe of uh, we didn't know what we didn't know. That's right. Yeah. And then subsequently spent six years attempting to engineer our way around uh, the impact of those assumptions. For example, I don't even think the guys that invented the vacuum columns realized what a terrific invention that was. It was, absolutely. Because it wasn't until it's we good. got rid of them that <laughs> we discovered a whole bunch of, a whole universe of stuff that we, you know, ISVs and interlayer slips and Z folds and just a ton of stuff that just wasn't, was a non-issue. That's right. Doing. But the end, end result, it was a six year war, but the end result is the technology, the tape deck working together, the teams working together bought the tape deck together with the technology that had the disc, the recording channel, and it was a very, very uh, successful design, implementation, and uh, very good field experience in terms of UIs and DUIs. Yeah, yeah actually the other two things uh, we sort of agreed on yesterday, I think actually the caching was fundamental that allowed the, that replaced the vacuum tube, that allowed the ice, Isolation electrically, as opposed right. to isolation mechanically, right. and uh, uh, the other one wa was the uh, cartridge itself. The decision was yeah, the, uh, the banding reel to reel go to a cartridge. The, the uh, assumption there was that uh, we talked a little bit about okay, what is media life, and those are mostly marketing apples. Those are not generally eating apples. It's a bunch of voodoo right. numbers because the magnetism on a piece of tape will be there until the sun explodes. It doesn't go anywhere. Yep. Uh, most of the errors in tape uh, are caused by some type of tape mishandling, uh, overexposure, say, to high temperatures that uh, will erase the tape. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, uh, back when there were mom and pops uh, first sprouting up to rent you a VHS tape and a player if you needed one to go home and watch a movie, they had a thermal uh, uh, label on them, a little oh. dot, because if you expose that uh, VHS cassette to, on a Tucson uh, car dash, that the magnet magnetism would be erased. But the mom and pop doesn't know that when you return the tape, so they check that to see what temperature that thing has been exposed to. Uh, they also attempted, believe it or not, to design the plastics to melt at approximately that same critical temperature. And I am guilty of bringing a VHS tape back one day. Oh, it was so you know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so so that cartridge was just in and of itself and Dan I see has some uh, exhibits was uh, more than meets the eye yes absolutely uh, yesterday we talked about uh, squealing I remember squealing when we would load these things in and there was this uh, squealing oh, all over the laboratory the, yeah this cartridge was supposed to be one inch thick and uh, somehow it became 24.5 millimeters um. <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't enough clearance to completely yeah. release the brake That's button right. and we yeah. had all this squealing oh, yeah. and all the labs and back, eventually yeah. we changed the brake button slightly to uh, fix it but it's just kind of an anecdotal uh -huh. so the again part of the reliability maintainability was the plan was uh, static guides went to air bearing guides with anything. compliant Compl metal foil That's right. And then, uh, the, but the tape was abrasive, and n nothing against the tape. We just underestimated it, and so then Joe Garcia and others worked on uh, for the what was the 3042 meter per second model, the B22, with the compliant guide with little ceramic buttons on the end, and so that became the compliant guide with eight, eight fingers on each uh, D bearing to to ease the tape down. So we had started with open channel guides, but there was too much play, there was a lot of wear. Dan mentioned, so we on one side we put kind of a flexible, thin metal member. Like a leaf spring. Like a leaf spring, and we were just wearing that, the chrome tape was just wearing that thing out. So the ceramic buttons, I'd forgotten about those, but that was quite clever and it worked very well. Yeah, that was another one of those. Um, unexpected consequences of using chrome dioxide. We didn't know. We didn't know. <laughs> yeah, because when, once we finally got the basic tape half with the larger D bearings of the 3480, we thought we were home free, but it was more like the eye of the hurricane. There were all these other problems like Joe Garcia's gravity buttons on the compliant guide. That <clears throat> A lot of invention was needed even after we had the basic tape path understood, because now you were getting you were talking about reliability issues. Now we were starting to use the drive for a longer period of time, and seeing oh, this issue is coming up. The wear is a problem, and and then there were uh, after another problem was that the, caused by the um, uh, the, 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 um, the guides not being up to the. Abrasiveness uh, of the tape was a, f a 50 kilohertz shear wave. That was a, the tape was like a imagine jello between your hands and you're moving it back and forth. Well, the tape would oscillate at 50 kilohertz, and so we knew at that point we not only needed to implement Joe Garcia's little buttons, but we had to ceramatize the entire tape path, both upper f any flanges like on the decoupler or the tension transducer or the deep bearings themselves. Everything the tape would only touch something that was ceramic. Um, walk verbally walk me through the tape path as as it comes out of the cartridge. Okay, so you, you, uh, Bill Ruger invented what's called a, a panacam threader, and as the tape cartridge was loaded into the drive, the the leader uh, leader block would nestle against a pin which was hanging upside down, and it had a little bulbous part so that as the leader block hit it, that it would come down and would stay in place. Then Panacam Threader had a miniature version of the tape path on its inside, and then the linkage would follow that cam, so to speak, and thread the, the leader block first around the decoupler. The de there was a long distance in order to, for these D bearings to work. We felt they had to have a high angle of wrap. And so that meant a long distance. F if, if um, let's see, if the head might be here. Uh, and, the, and the cartridge back here, there was a long distance for the tape to have what I might call like a, a cantilever or an, a leverage arm. So Bill Berger invented this decoupler, which was um, kind of, would put an omega loop in the tape, a bow in the tape. So it was in a way, we were going back to mama. It had a vacuum in it, didn't it? Yeah, it had a little mini <laughs> vacuum in it. So the first thing, that, so let's put, take the tape path up this way, this line. So this thing is like this. It's coming up here. It goes past this thing called a decoupler that had a vacuum in it and a couple of bearings on it <laughs> just to kind of, I guess, stabilize that long, right. unsupported spot. Then it would go all the way around this head guide through, de-bearing, head, de-bearing. Then it would come all the way back here and around the tension transducer, as I recall. Yep. 
And then I think it went back to the take-up reel, which Dan has brought some examples of, and I think it went back in like that. Correct. Is what I recall. Yep. And this is our leader block. Yesterday, I, I poked a little bit of fun at it because we did discover some design flaws long after the fact. But uh, setting that aside, at the time, uh, this uh, had several functions and it was uh, quite ingenious. And uh, Dan has brought some examples of what the take-up wheel looked like because the the uh, leader block would go into those slots. You might want to. Want me to talk about yeah, this? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go through the evolution. Um, we knew that the there, when the design came from San Jose to Boulder, and then of course from Boulder to Tucson, we knew that the leader block, which which is here, would have to go into a mating take-up reel. And we were very concerned about print through, where print through would be the, a plastic deformation of the tape due to maybe an imperfection or mismatch between the leader block and the well that is holding it. So I thought as a, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're great. The transparency, your tie-in. Uh, oh. So okay. if you put something white behind the. Uh, uh, oh, like this? Yes, like that. That yeah. would make it. Those might be better, actually. This is actually, either one. I should have stopped the tape, but we'll just cut all this out. Okay. okay. It's just a, no, no, something white. Like these employment applications. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so That's great. That, that is great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I can okay. zoom in on that. So I thought as a mechanical engineer, maybe the first thing to do was to uh, control the tolerances so that the leader block any, any step function between what the leader block and the uh, hub of the take-up reel would be minimized. And, and so and the goal was is this had to sit for 24 hours because they thought that, um, there you go. They, they so this leader block, what Dan was talking about, I can't quite get that in there. Yeah, sorry, it, over time. The one. Oh, there, we go. there we go. You notice the- uh, You need to back your hand up, uh, John. Yeah, well, there you notice you the back end of that leader block has to have the exact same radius as the take-up reel itself. So, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, mechanical business on the front end to engage with the threader and to, to get it back seated. But there's equally uh, critical function on the back end. To, and and the print through Dan's talking about is as you we talked about winding stresses yesterday. Uh -huh. and I think uh -huh. you even wrote a model of that once. Uh -huh. um, if it, any deformation in here could permanently deform the tape after it's been sitting there for some period of time and that could cause uh, errors. So let me give you some more uh, give you some more leaves okay. here. <laughs> so so the aluminum so this thing had to sit for twenty four hours with tape on down that that's the goal was that might take uh, um, let me see this if I can get that back in here. It's probably the metric conversion guy. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> it might take a, a customer engineer that long to fix the tape drive. But uh, the, the printer was terrible. So I'm thinking, okay, we knew from this model of uh, hub st or, or tape stresses on the hub that if the hub's more compliant, that the stresses will be reduced. So we tried a plastic hub, and it was pretty bad, but a little improvement. So maybe we're getting close. So try some circumferential holes. The holes got bigger and bigger, and finally the holes broke through. And so, ah, little mini doors. And so these mini doors uh, were a contrivance where if there's a mismatch between the leader block and the hub of the tape, that the, these mini doors were compliant and they would actually uh, conform to that mismatch and the, the print through problem was at least mitigated enough that it became part of the tape drive. So. And it was sort of a, an accidental thing that we said, well, uh, something's not working, but let's just kept, keep messing with it, and, and finally it did. And in terms of these mini doors, the idea of having a compliance in the hub, it's like, okay, well, where else could you use some compliance? And that was also in the leader block. And um, so, and so in, in it's possible by dumb luck that they were going to core out the leader block anyhow, but at the time it, it, when this was all being invented, the leader block was a solid mass. And I said, along with Mo Richard, my co-inventor, let's, let's core out the leader block to have this mini door effect on the leader block as you do in the take-up reel. So that's where my first two patents on the 3480 came from. And it was sort of interesting that when Jim Prashan, the patent attorney, saw 
oh, the leader blocked the card out, and you guys wrote an invention disclosure on it. It only took them two and a half weeks to do a, a finalize the patent application on that. So it's an all-time IBM record for me in terms of getting things, you know, getting out of the starting gate. So th this is non-trivial, and you can see that there's a lot of devil in the details, but this is a direct consequence of the cartridge assumption. Because in the open reel, all threading was was a tape hanger, you know, going like this, <laughs> over a, a round, perfectly right. round cylindrical take-up reel hub, and uh, away you go. It was, it was basically a non-issue in 3420, so this was all brand new uh, challenges to us. And uh, John, you're not a fan of leader blocks. No, I didn't say that. Uh, I, <laughs> when that oh, happened, so, so we had some issues with leader blocks down the road. Okay, I think this is elegant. It solved the problem, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was the exact optimum design. It turned out we did some force analysis later. We had issues with leader blocks not getting back into the cartridge at times. And of course, the it's certainly in an automated environment, uh, you don't know that the leader block is hanging loose when you load it and that caused problems and uh, I remember we had to put use and care manuals out telling tape hangers to check and make sure the leader block was seated before they loaded the tape and uh, and there was a tool for reattaching the tool. The yeah, leader you, block. Yeah, you had to, uh, first of all you got to detach that brake, you notice I was pushing pretty hard with that pin over there to give Dan some uh, rope to <laughs> Um, so you had to be able to decouple that, so there was a tool that went on the clutch, and, and uh, I think it was Magnetica. Uh-huh. And, and then, then and you could pull this out, and there was a little kit for replacing the leader block. Yeah. Right, because sometimes it would tear. So so John's concerns about the leader block were valid, it's, and that's where They just didn't on. show up till like, automated environments and right. things that we hadn't anticipated. But then he worked on that for the LTO. Yeah, and LTO I had mentioned the other day, and we'll, we're having a whole separate session on that oh, sure. tomorrow, and you're welcome to sit down and observe if you like. Uh, I mentioned that this LTO cartridge was very much designed by committee, and we even admitted in a press release that there wasn't much to brag about here. Oh, no. It was what can three companies agree to. Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, HP had a uh, hard requirement to be able to enable a half-high form factor, which is why we did not use the 3480 uh -huh. cartridge. We could not agree on the leader block uh, because it was going to get in the way of their plan to make a half high cartridge. So what we all did by committee is we decided it was going to be a pen. That's it. <laughs> no, no, but that was great. <laughs> and that pen, when we did Jaguar, I mentioned that we wanted to basically put this into this cartridge for automation compatibility, uh -huh. and we just translated the pen right, yeah. in, right into this cartridge, but uh, preserving that form factor yeah. for uh, automation. Uh -huh. But no, the leader block was, I, I'm, I'm simply saying there's some science in there, it's not just... You know, a piece of plastic right. at the end of the tape. <laughs> sure, uh, Al Rizzi would like to ask a question. You, you mentioned that the design, I forget the name of the person, was a pantograph cam following, pick it up the leader. Or Bill Ruger, uh -huh. Was that the uh, original design that, that was actually implemented, the first design, or was there some other, is that a fix to some other approaches. Well, it was a fix to another approach, and that's a good point, because uh, Akatio used like a racetrack, and the racetrack was uh, above the tape path, and it, it, it's, it's, um, it, it was a channel where there was plastic, and the plastic would move through this channel and carry like a, a threading pin with it. And because you had plastic on plastic, now there's a lot of debris. Debris would shower down on the tape path. So even though it would function, mm -hmm. maybe most of the time, sometimes the head would get, because we were trying to, a very complicated, here's the two smaller D bearings, and the head was across from the D bearings, so it had to come around and form an omega loop to thread through uh, what John called the head guide through. Um, most of the time it would do that. Uh, it would get hung up a little bit, but the debris issue was terrible. And so this is where when Bill Ruger invented the Panacam threader and you you didn't have the debris at all. But we also had to bring the head back on the other side too. That's right, we also had to bring the head back on the other side. Uh, yeah. But we, we needed to do that because then we also enlarged the D-bearings to make them just as big as we possibly could to, to maximize the guiding surface that uh, along the edges of the tape. And, and what is a Panacam threader? The Panacam threader was um, uh, it comes from the panograph where you'd have 
um, a, a stylus tracing over a known object and then something, there was a linkage which would extend and so you can make a copy of a different size of that original drawing. And so the, but the, what Bill Ruger did was to say, all right, I'm going to, at the end of this longer linkage, I'm going to put the threading pin and then move that around the tape pad as the Panicam itself followed this internal map of a, a miniature of the tape drive. Yeah, and any debris, if there was any, was at the, at the miniature and not out at the head. Right, not even in the tape. Right. And, and it, it used a, a roller bearing to go through the, the cam surface, so there really wasn't debris there. Okay. It was a very elegant design. I, the, the predecessor, the, uh, what did you call it? I called it the laugh track. But oh, that laugh track, or a race track, but yeah, laugh track, track, yeah. It was painful to watch it thread. It was yes. noisy, it was clunky. Yeah, it was, it was like, is it going to make it? Is it going to make it? <laughs> yeah. what, what kind of time frame are we talking between the two? About a year and a half, as I recall. This is, this is going back into the early 80s, so it's difficult to... What, what I recall, Dan, is uh, we had the head on the same side as the D-bearings when I arrived at IBM. Somebody had the brilliant idea of moving it to the other side. I confess to that, by the way. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. So he's going to take the blame. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably about 79 or 80 that we I did that. that. Mm -hmm. And then we realized very quickly what a thorough, disastrous idea that yes, was. was. And we brought the head back. Yeah. So I don't know if the Panacam was on the that original version with the head on the D-bearing side or if it was in the later oh, We version. didn't have, I don't for, for Intrepid, we didn't have a threader okay. at all. Okay. We weren't that far along. So it was probably around 80 where we went from the laugh track to the Panacam. Uh-huh. And as Dan indicated, the Panacam, uh, the cam guide was, was just a plastic plate. It wasn't mm -hmm. very large. It had a groove that basically was a miniature geometry of the tape path. And like Dan said, it's kind of like a that concept is used in lots of places for us. It's used in printing, for example. Mm -hmm. It's used in uh, all kinds of applications. But it was a, I thought it was a very clever application of a borrowing and a, an idea from a completely unrelated field and solving the problem. Exactly. And, yeah. and would somebody just, for us uh, na a naive persons, uh, compare and contrast the threading in a reel-to-reel? -reel? Well, in a reel-to-reel, -reel, as I mentioned, uh, you got an open, big ten and a half inch reel. The end of the tape is just hanging off, just like this. <laughs> and uh, there's another reel over here. And for them, all they had to do was pull this thing across and get it started a, a wind or two on the take-up reel. And once they had that, they would just hit the switch, and all of a sudden, tape would suck down into those vacuum columns, and you were ready to rock and roll. But it was a take tape. It was a tape hanger that had to do this. And I don't think it was too unusual for them to lick their finger to uh, oh, yeah, probably, get it yeah. started yeah. so that it stuck a little bit to get it started and maybe five or six wraps and kind of tighten it up, cinch it a little bit, and then you're ready to rock and roll. So, so again, the, there was some sort of mechanism that pulled or blew It was or never pushed. automated. It was never automated. Not in the stand-up versions of 3420s. Now, later on, as Al reminded me, because I completely forgot, and I appreciate that, we did have... 3420 open reel compatible devices that did not use vacuum columns. There was one called Sunfish. That's right, Sunfish, yes. They tended to be uh, kind of the size of a stove and it was mm -hmm. kind of flat here or maybe slightly angled as I recall. I think we did that in conjunction with Fujitsu Siemens was one of the products. I don't recall whether there was an automated way of uh, threading those or not. I don't remember. I don't, I don't recall. So. But yes, yeah, Sunfish was another reel-to-reel -reel tape yeah. path, and yeah. as I recall, it, it it beat the 3480. It was just a simpler thing. It only had nine tracks, so it, it, it's not like it's struggling with 18 tracks and not much higher density. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have, again, possibly in my own ignorance, the uh, idea that some, at least perhaps your competitors offered self-threading tape. I think they did, and but we had kind of, we had kind of abandoned it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked. We, we kind of did Sunfish as a little bit of an insurance policy, but uh, 3480 was really the, the ultimate goal and the path we were committed to. So we talked about the header and getting the tape through to the take up reel, and the first thing the tape encounters is a decoupler, which again 
is perhaps a consequence of the elimination of vacuum tubes? How did the coupler get in there? Vacuum columns. A vacuum column. Well, I have my own theory. John and, and Andy may have other things. But you could envision a solution space which was almost non-existent in terms of all these variables coming together. And so the decoupler took a lot of the noise out of the tape path in terms of the, the standard wraps during the tape and so the tape would track properly across the head. Um, and, it, and we could have been seeing some of this 50 kilohertz issue and other issues in the tape path, which we weren't aware of yet. But the decoupler was able to enlarge the solution space so that we actually had something to take into product test and do testing with. Yeah, this, this is a wild exaggeration, but imagine putting a tiny vacuum column right where the tape comes out before it enters the tape path. Imagine a vacuum column that is helping decouple some of the noise chatter coming out of the cartridge because there's a lot of variables in the, uh, the clutch alignment and just a lot of variables. And, and you know, so in the limit, this could be like a vacuum column the size of a 3420 if you yeah. wanted to picture that, that it's going through to decouple this noise from where we want it quiesced up here at the uh, business end of the tape drive. Well, this was a very miniature version of a vacuum column. It was kind of a, I think it had kind of a bearing here and a bearing here, so, and then there was a vacuum in the middle, so the tape kind of went like that and it was getting sucked a little bit. Yeah, just a tiny amount. So, just so imagine a very mini vacuum column right. right out of the chute just to try to decouple some stuff. Was that a critical component? I have no idea. Oh, uh, now, now to me, it go was, take one out and see if it still works. No, no, no. <laughs> it's true. At the beginning, it was absolutely critical. But then, as we solved more of the other problems mm -hmm. in the tape path, put in all the ceramics, the little gravity or the ceramic fingers that Joe Garcia's and other things. Eventually, then we were turning off the vacuum to the decoupler and found. Oh, we did. Okay. Yeah, and this goes back to Saguaro One, the B11, and and uh, that we were saying, hey. It, oh, no, we were impressed by our management to reduce costs. It's like, okay, well, we turned off the vacuum to the decoupler, and there's no de degradation reliability. Um, and, and again, it, you get to think of in terms of a solution space. We expanded the solution space enough by fixing other things in the tape path that the decoupler, which was critical when it was first conceived, was not so critical anymore. It became the appendix of the tape. Yeah, yeah that's right. And so, um, in fact, when we were trying to market, the, it was the 3490, I believe that was reaching its end of life. And we, this is back when I was now in doing patent licensing and technology transfers. We were trying to market the 3490 tape path, and one of the customers said, um, uh, why are you still having a decoupler in there? Because we run our own experiments and we don't think you need it either. But <laughs> it was one of those things that was hard to remove once it became part of it. But you're right, eventually it was went from being absolutely critical to something which was simply there. Hmm. Along the same lines, uh, one of the things that I did was uh, uh, all the cleaner blade experiments that ended up yes. going into the... Um, which into the which is the next thing encountered in the tape it's pack. the next thing that you encounter. As a matter of fact, we kind of forgot about it. It's before you get to the debearing right. unit and it's under... And I had described yesterday in my uh, evolving what the cleaner blade became, which was not an invention of mine. I just grabbed a bunch of existing cleaner blades off of a whole bunch of other products and tried them all. And we ended up using one, I think, that may have been from a 3420. I don't remember. That's what I remember. That's what I think it was. I described to them yesterday about how I spent the whole, you know, I spent several weeks at the Grant building on third shift on the single track reliability tester, <laughs> only to find out that I was basically measuring how much gypsum dust was in the area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because that's all I captured in the screen oh, when yeah. I got it analyzed. It was, um, so you could argue that it became an appendix. but. It turns out that, you know, it, it wasn't clear to us that the cleaner blade was solving a problem, but it did seem to help stabilize, if you will, or certainly remove some debris that might be in the atmosphere. But later upon it, it turned out that the cleaner blade might have been causing as many problems as it was solving, if not causing more problems than it was solving. And I remember, I was the guy who put the cleaner blade in the tape path. So later on, when I was in management, I attempted to take the cleaner blade out of the tape path for, I think it was 3490E, 
Um, and they said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> well, why not? I put it in. <laughs> yeah. And they said, in fact, we, because we're riding backwards now, we think we need another cleaner blade oh, on the other side. I remember, okay. through. I remember seeing so that. So we had two cleaner blades. <laughs> and then I think at some point we threw them both out. I don't, I don't remember when. But, uh, and again, for the lay person, what, what's a cleaner blade supposed to do? What problems it solve? Well, in theory, uh, because of static electricity, environmental contamination, smokers in the day, um, there's something that needs to be appreciated here that doesn't happen in DISC. Uh, I'm not saying that there isn't a similar phenomenon, but this, if you take a one micron particle, so that's 40 millionths of an inch in diameter, which is the average size of a smoke particle, very close to the average size perhaps of a piece of tape debris or a piece of atmospheric contamination, when that particle goes through the head tape interface, because the tape has stiffness, it isn't just a 40 millionths of an inch little defective perturbation to a very tiny uh, fraction of a track. It forms a tent, 30 thousandths of a, right. yep. because I did a lot of analysis, uh, 30 thousandths of an inch in diameter, 30 mils in diameter from this 40 micro inch particle forms this gigantic tent as it goes through there and it'll wipe out several tracks. So you would call that soft error rate. If, if you had a phenomenon like that in a hard disk, you'd do two things. Uh, you'd burnish the disk or you're, eventually you'd beat the dang thing off with the head. You'd right. demark that sector and never write there. And But in tape, we don't do that. As I told you, we just write through everything. And, <laughs> and count on our A cross P to uh, save us when we mess it up. So the cleaner blade was just what we kind of we call it. It kind of looks like a little Gillette razor. You know, it's two blades that are kind of angled like this, and there's a vacuum here, so the tape goes over, kind of goes in. And when it's going this way, in theory, this guy is scraping stuff off, and when it's going the other way, this other blade is scraping stuff off. And the justification for it was, first of all, tradition: 50 years of cleaner blades and tape pads. Little bit of empirical data based on gypsum dust, anyway. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, and and we just thought it was probably a good engineering practice. It wasn't in the design when I arrived at IBM, and uh, no, like I said, I was doing the experiments at the Grant Building to see if it was worth doing. I have some patents on cleaner blades. I'm not real proud of them. I oh, know that's I've good. I've got them. <laughs> that's good. So yeah, that was the next component encounter we forgot all about. No. Then you get to that D bearing that was non-pneumatic and is now pneumatic and it's got air coming out and it's got these ceramic. compliant guides and ceramic buttons and pressing gently against the bottom piece of ceramic on the edge and then you finally get to the business end over the head. And Before we, the leaf bearing is just a uh, uh, constant compliance, it's not controlled? Yeah, it's, it's not just, controlled. It's, it's, just not, a, it's not an active component, it's a passive component and it and just it, it was like fingers with little ceramic buttons on the end of them that just gently pressed on the edge. And again, the ceramic buttons being for some, wear. something that was added because the original, I because guess, all, the, uh, abrasivity all, of chrome all tape. metal design was. Uh, it would the chrome tape would just slice through. Slice, it, like, slice through it. Through it. So and, and, and once it sliced through it, then it was it'd be setting up a shear wave in the tape. Right. All mm -hmm. kinds of bad stuff. And, now, and and then it got to the business end right here. Well, no, it comes to D bearings next, right? Well, no, AD I, we just talked about the D. That was the D bearing. Uh, so the well, D-bearing was a large that's the cylindrical <laughs> service, pressurized air, had these fingers that would keep the tape, hopefully, pressed against a datum. <laughs> and then it would come off that D-bearing and go over the head. Air bearing on the, on the sides too, or just air bearing on the, on just the, in the uh, business side of the, of the tape? And so the, where the tape was so the shear, the, the lateral alignment is controlled by, by mechanics? Guys, so we're not describing this correctly. Well, oh, yeah, the d bearing is actually thinner than the width of the tape. So the tape actually stuck up a teeny tiny amount. And that's where then these, these gravity uh, buttons and fingers would actually gently ride on the tape itself. And, and, and that would seat the tape against the lower ceramic flange. Yeah, I had a head guide crew once upon a time, and I wish I oh. had one back because it's it's so difficult to describe without oh. just holding it up. But yeah, this tape was going around this large D bearing, and the fingers were like this, pressing it down against something, another piece of ceramic on the bottom. Of the bearing. Right. So, so the reference surface was the flange, and the fingers yeah. were pushing it down. Right. See, I had, in my ignorance, 
thought of the bit of the fingers pressing against the width of the tape, not the side of the tape. Okay. Now, oh, right. now I understand. Now the side of the tape. I don't no, know my, my, my ignorance. So then it enters the head, and there is a. I, I mentioned yesterday for Dan's uh, benefit that the alignment of the head to the tape path in 3480 was so critical that unlike 3420, the head was not a field replaceable part. Right. Because those alignments to those two D bearings had to be established with great precision in the factory. And uh, so that we actually included the D bearings as what we called the field replaceable unit or head guide through. And was it a whole casting bearings and head? It was a casting, with ceramic plates, the bearings, the ceramic fingers, the head on a skew plate that you could adjust the skew, you could adjust its penetration, you could adjust its pitch. Um, these awful cables hanging down, because I changed many of them and it was no fun. <laughs> yeah, you know, we didn't have arm electronics like in the hard drives, so there was no <clears throat> preconditioning of the signal. <clears throat> the unconditioned signal had to go long distance, and thus there was all of this. Um, this is actually a 3490E, so it's got two cables to each module reading. Right. Read, but the uh, 3480 only had uh, a pair of cables like so. Yeah, and just because we call them the crowbar cables is not <laughs> no reflection upon the design. But they were stiff. <laughs> and, and in fact, John mentioned the skew plate because we had to adjust the skew alignment of the head perpendicular to the lower flanges of the head guide through. Uh, using a differential screw standard, like in the 3420, but then pillars had to be designed. I think Paul Behrman came up with that concept, I forget. But the, so these two pillars were part of the casting, and once oh, the right. skew plate was aligned, then the pillars were clamped in place because there was such torque by these, these uh, crowbar cables. Just, just the CE trying to wrestle these cables back into the cards after he set it down could mess up the head alignment relative to those bearings. Right. So you practically had to, once you had it aligned, you virtually cemented it in place. Yeah. And it was, therefore, it was never replaceable anyway. That's right. Yeah. Al, Al Ruzzi would like to add a question. Yes, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, a lot of the, uh, I'll call it experimentation or testing you did. It sounds like it was part of the engineering uh, testing to establish how you're going to do the product. Were some of these problems, though, did we go into test, you know, product test, and then have to come in with ceramic fingers and ceramicizing the, the guides? I mean, did we basically enter test with some level that required some of the type of fixes that you're talking about? You're talking you know, I'm talking about the timing. The, 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 well, the, my, my involvement of this goes way back when, back even to the Intrepid days where we would wheel, I hate to say this, but we would wheel a drive into product test knowing it would be rejected. If this would be late Friday, we'd wheel the drive into product test knowing that they'd reject it on Monday. That It was very iterative. In uh, fact, constant iteration and, 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 and even going back when I said there were like four basic things for the 3480, Saguaro being the third one, and it wasn't until we entered the fourth phase, which is like we, we, we realized we were merely in the eye of the hurricane, that we had to really harden the tape path, including the ceramic guides, the, 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 the ceramic fingers, um, all of these other things, uh, the solving 50 kilohertz. Um, we, we had to get these to actually finish product test. So there was a very long involved process with product test. Um, yeah. Um Tell you my perspective as a kid joining. Oh no! <laughs> uh, there was no schedule integrity, at least not. No. In the, I mean, there may have once upon a time have been a schedule that said we're going to have a formal EVT here and we're going to have a DVT here or whatever we called it in the day. As far as I'm concerned, product test just became part of the development team. They just became a huge resource to help us vet stuff. They didn't like it because they wanted to be that kind of autonomous gatekeeper. But there was really nothing else for them to do if they weren't helping us expose problems. They're just sitting there with a big catcher's mitt waiting for nothing. But no, that's an excellent mm -hmm. way to say it, that they, they would uncover these problems and then we'd say, okay, we, this is what, how we're going to solve them. So there was a real partnership there. Like a lot of software projects, unfortunately, a lot of quality was tested into 3480. Yes. And it's painful to admit that, but it was a, a reality. Could I'm not sure it's clear in the several tapes, uh, 
but you've talked, I think, about four code name versions of the drive itself, mm -hmm. as opposed we nail down the media code names itself. Uh, would you just step through them from the first by name and about the time frame? Yeah, I had mentioned this yesterday, so I'll take it. You can finish it. Uh, we inherited it as Intrepid from Boulder. You inherited it as Intrepid from Boulder. And then whatever, and then clearly that thing we inherited, as Dan is describing, went through a lot of evolution and rethinking as we uh, started finding out stuff that we didn't know we didn't know. And we adopted a cactus theme because we were in the middle of the Saguaro Desert. And I believe our first kind of Tucson version of Intrepid, or evolution if you will, was uh, called, I think, Saguaro or Ocotillo. No, Ocotillo. 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 Spell that, please. O-C-O-T-I-L-L-O. -O. It's a very beautiful kind of <laughs> leafy, branchy thing. It's kind of hard to describe. Uh, I've got a couple in my yard. They're gorgeous. And then uh, there was a, a stand, and Dan was much closer to this, but it Eventually, there was a, maybe it was because we flipped ahead again or whatever, but it became Saguaro. Mm -hmm. And there was a Saguaro 1 and a Saguaro 2. And later on, there was a barrel, but that was after. The right, that's a shed. cactus. So also. That's yeah. also a cactus. Yeah. And Saguaro 2 came up first. That was a 2 meter per second drive. Then there was a thought, hey, uh, there might be some more mid-range customers who might want a 1 meter per second drive. So that became Saguaro 1. And Sora One had its own problems, which were, uh, if you will, uh, as uh, all these other problems, uh, totally unexpected. That the recording channel was such that, and Judd McDowell, who did the recording channel, explained this to me, uh, that the permissible acceleration of the tape, or jitter, whatever, within the tape path was a function of the square of the tape's velocity. So when we reduced the velocity by a factor of two from two meters to one meter per second, we actually shrunk our tolerance window by a factor of four. So the Joe Garcia fingers didn't work anymore. And so I was thinking one day, because we we're, were getting eaten alive to solve this problem, Joe's fingers, uh, the original compliant guys were like a leaf spring, a metal leaf spring. He put ceramic tips on the end to, to reduce the wear. Well, what if we took his design one step further and reduced the spring, got rid of the spring rate, because maybe that's causing the jitter, and so we just had a, a deadweight gravity button. It was still Joe Garcia's uh, uh, ceramic tip, but now on a dead weight. So we tried that with eight, he had eight fingers and each D bearing, we tried that and it didn't work at all. I go, oh, we're going to get killed if we don't solve this. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, let's do something really radical. Let's put two gravity buttons by each side of the head and one in each entrance or exit way of the D bearing, and that worked. And so we were done. That's the problem. But so we had to scramble to solve square one. So the, the, the next sort of time question, uh, really following along, Al's theme is so. What? Which one came out of DVT? Which you know? Oh, Saguaro two. So, so, so we shipped the two meter per second version. I think so. It was so, a four meter two. Or something. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. And so the, the, was Saguaro <coughs> one a follow on? Oh, I'm sorry. If, Intrepid. You know, it was a it no, was no. a reduced performance right. follow on option that. This is typical IBM, you know, we kind of sell them the same thing and then we've got these code things that we can switch. And yeah. So Intrepid stuff. was the EVT machine? Oh, no, no. Never Intrepid never went that far. Okay. It, it, it was always rejected going into product tests. It, it, we want, <laughs> well, no, it's true. They, what they wanted in general, as I recall, and, and again, John and Andy may remember things slightly different. They wanted roughly a 10 to the 6 bits per soft error. And out of Intrepid, we only got 10 to the second. So we were off by four <laughs> orders of magnitude. It was like a disaster. And Remember I talked could, about we'd do a pass one night at E4, and the next night it's E7, the next it, night it's E3, and that and was maybe, gypsum dust, by the way. Yeah. So, so. And maybe I remember d d d it being at its worst case. So we went to Ocotillo with the D bearings, but the head on the opposite side. And as I recall, we were getting our reliability into the 10 to the fifth, not quite 10 to the sixth, maybe five times 10 to the fifth, but we're very close. 
and we had actually tried the larger deep bearings, which became Saguaro, but we couldn't get that high, so we, we went down this blind path of Ocotino. But, this, but, once, but once we realized that wasn't the way to go, we went to bigger deep bearings, and finally went with ceramics and everything, we got to the 10 to the 6, and even, as I recall, we were starting to get to 10 to the 7th with all of these improvements of raw, uncorrected b bits per soft error. Um, and th then it was at that point, just said, yes, we have a product. So that Savaro 2 then went into EVT, problems were fixed, went into DVT, and actually then shipped, and then Savaro 1 became the one meter right. per second right. version. Right, because okay. they, they wanted a family. And so that, that seemed like the easiest way was to, and it's, again, when you're thinking mid-range customers, they don't need all, they don't need to take drive that's going to suck up all of this data when they can't deliver it at that speed. So for the, 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 the people with the smaller computers, less, less data rate requirements, that a smaller tape path, or not small, a slower tape path would be more in concert with the speed they're delivering the data. Yeah. So, so we, we hadn't finished the tape path yet? No, so, no, we're not. I'm, okay. I'm just trying, uh, I was going to say perhaps when we go back through uh, some of these problems, it might be interesting to say, well, that occurred during the Sorara 2, or that occurred. Oh, in, sure. Uh, to, you know, sort of yeah. Yeah. space well, it out. I'm not even sure Sorara 1 ever got a lot of market. I don't think it did. I, I'm not even sure we ever Was it ever really shipped? shipped very many. I don't remember. I know we shipped. Okay. I know we shipped some prototype machines and beta test machines. I don't know that we ever shipped any to paying customers. And, and see, it, it took so long to develop, a certain, a certain length of period, to develop this uh, B11 Swirl 1. That is possible by then the customers were upping their data rates and they needed the original version of Swirl 2. So, they, you, you know, it's like the customer requirements were continuing to climb. And we were designing, in certain ways, a retro drive and, and, and for, and, uh, for, for more mid-range, but maybe the market just disappeared by the time. Did it have the same farm factor, Joe? The same, same machine. Okay, same machine. <laughs> With Except for speed. the tape guys. <laughs> and the tape uh, guys. From the outside, you I couldn't tell them apart. No. Okay. All right. That was in Joel fact, there was compatibility, wasn't there? Uh-huh. Read-write compatibility. Yeah. Or maybe not right, but certainly maybe there was regret. I, th I think, think it was. was. But I think the main point, Dan, was making is that a simple thing is changing the velocity by a factor of two. Not everything scales linearly with velocity. It's yeah. right. Yeah. It's some, things don't, some things don't scale at all. Yeah. Other things scale more radically than we thought. And yeah. so it's kind of like every time we did something that we thought was going to be a no-brainer. <laughs> That's right. It's true. It's very we true. We were back in the suit. Yeah. What it's happened? So I think we're at the head now. Yeah, we made it to the head, I think. Yes, yes. So this is where I come in because I was actually hired to design the microgeometry of the surface of this recording unit. And I uh, borrowed heavily from a concept that a guy in San Jose had. I forgot his name, McConnell, or Bill McConnell, I think was his name. And what you'll see in this microgeometry, and I might have a picture over there I can dig out, as you'll see what we call blind slots, so... Just hold it steady so I can zoom in. Okay. And let me briefly tell you what problem that I was hired to solve and took my time doing it. No. <laughs> like we all did. Yes, we all did. <laughs> because for some reason this was not quite as critical of a deal on 3420. The, the alignment specifications were a lot more relaxed. Uh, when they wanted, uh, they, the head tape it, spacing didn't have to be as close as this was. That was a big deal. Yes. Yeah. And if they had a little bit of head tape interface problem, they'd just crank the vacuum up a little bit. Oh, yeah, no, that's too it. Bob Riley did it more than oh. once. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this was going to be much more critical because we wanted to establish a uniform fly height of approximately five millionths of an inch and at the business areas on the head where the right gap is and the read gap is and control it. So this was a radical new concept. You can't see it, but I, I'll dig out a picture at a break. But there are slots called blind slots that are machined into the leading edge of that tape. And those slots don't go all the way to the gap. They go a certain ways into the head. And the tape, when it 
lands on the head, lands somewhere in the region of those slots between the edge of the head and the recording gap. Now the reason those slots exist is because it was observed a long time ago that air has viscosity and that air approximates the Newtonian fluid law. Um, and as a result of the fact that air has a viscosity, although it, we never really thought it was important before, and because air is compressible, uh, if we just sent this thing over a cylinder, like what we did in 3420, the thing would fly at about 40 millionths of an inch, and it was inoperable. We couldn't write it or read it. So those uh, slots were designed to spoil air pressure buildup, and we had these elaborate two-dimensional uh, coupled uh, nonlinear partial differential equation programs that we had written to uh, play with that microgeometry and try to optimize it. In addition, we were able to reproduce this geometry in, a, in the form of a glass. And we were able then to take a glass head, put it up against a real piece of tape with a little vacuum column and a cap stand, a camera with a magnification of about 10x, and observe Newtonian rings from reflected light that would tell us what that fly height was all over the surface of that head. And if I took one light, white light picture, I took 100,000. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I wasn't always sitting at the computer. And so uh, it was super critical. We had literally the, the wrap angle tolerance was very tiny because if you over and if you under engage the slots uh, there was something called a dynamic shift in other words when the tape is at rest you might think okay it's it's right there well it's not imagine pushing a two by four over an oil drum okay that's not a straight line because the thing has stiffness and there's a, a bowing effect where well, you get the same thing at the micro level when you're putting tape over this uh, geometry and so if it's slightly underwrapped, it will the tape is actually underwrapped more than you think it is because of the bending stiffness. Right. And also when you start the tape, there's something called a dynamic shift. The incidence actually moves downstream about 10 mm -hmm. miles. Now what is that all about? Well, I scratched my head. I observed it for years. What is it? It turns out tape mylar is a viscoelastic material. When you think about going from a zero moment to a forced conformance to a radius that defines a moment. I'm talking about a, a moment uh, right. mechanically. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. and, you, and you do a strain rate analysis um, of the strain. The tape is basically going from zero strain to, a to some amount of strain defined by the other boundary condition called the radius of the head. And it's doing it at two meters per second, which is all an ass when you're down here at this <laughs> micro level. Those strain rates were very large, I calculated. And because tape is viscoelastic, it has what they call a complex modulus. In layman's terms, the stiffness of the mylar increases with strain rate, it becomes stiff. And there's models for that, same, whatever. And so that explained the dynamic shift. So that's just a long way of telling you that the alignment of this head relative to those guides was super critical for a whole bunch of reasons. And then uh, subsequent wear issues that we're not going to talk about now because we're finishing the tape pad. And then it exits the head and then my job is done and now it's Dan's job. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to talk about the, the puffer head and the, the leaf, leaf spring? Yeah, the puffer head to keep the sticks. Oh out. yeah. Um, okay, Armando did most of this stuff in here. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a brilliant guy and he was originally going to be invited but uh, the problem is that he, his participation in uh, 3480 was kind of limited to the uh, head right. uh, fabrication, mechanical fabrication. At some point in time, uh, we had this diction problem. We were concerned that if the tape was loaded, but uh, otherwise uh, in, in idle mode, uh, we would continue to apply some tension because we had to or the tape would fall out of the guides. And, uh, and if it sat there like that for a long period of time and environmental conditions weren't favorable, um, even though we had largely solved some of the stiction problem, uh, that we could still get tape sticking to the head. It's yeah, sort of like a saran wrap effect. Right. If nothing else, all the air pressure bleeds out and you got a Joe Buck. Oh, yeah. 
and uh, which, by the way, the Joe Block effect became the future HDI of the future. I'll, oh, I'll talk about that tomorrow on L2. We didn't even have any uh, wrap. We had a flat head. Oh, that's right. And we just simply set up the angle of incidence so that uh, we just squeezed all the air out, shaved it off, and it was atmospheric pressure would hold it together. Not, not even tension. So we had no tension component. That's right. That's an internal nerd. Uh, thing. <laughs> so we, in between these modules, Armando invented this super cool thing. I don't even know how he fabricated that. You probably might know more about this no, than I, I do, but uh, it, it was uh, kind of like two layers of something uh, with, a, with an orifice in and an orifice out, and it could be pressurized. Now that we have air pressure, we might as well use it everywhere. Yep. <laughs> and when the tape was stopped, it would push air, and, and we're talking about a fairly large air pressure. It's got to offset that tension to some degree to push the tape away from the head so that it wouldn't stick while it was waiting for the either an unload or another job or a reposition or something. And there's a uh, there's a, a spring in here to keep that head. This is a precision ground housing, very precise. This was actually a brilliant uh, concept that Armando was the patents on, uh, along with Bob Freeman. And, uh, I mentioned his last name. Bob Freeman, Armando. Uh -huh. Oh, Armando argued made a, um, and I can get him out here tomorrow if you want to meet him, but whatever, we'll talk Might about that nice. later. Uh, so I don't know. There's probably more to say about this. Oh yeah, I, I was confined to the microchannel. Oh sure, but see, the aluminum expands and contracts with temperature. Oh, sure. So that so the leaf spring needed to be put in there uh, under a certain amount of compression, so that, um, as I recall, before the leaf spring, that the head modules could become loose. And I forget, was it Amanda who did the leaf yeah. spring? So that was genius in terms of okay, now you've got something that's a compliant member. It's stiff enough to hold the modules in place but without cracking them. And as the, you get temperature variations, the, the aluminum may expand, that's fine. The least ring still holds the modules in place. So that's certainly one of the genius um, This things. was very early, very early. This whole concept of the housing and the whole structure because it just made the uh, alignments just so much easier because now it was precision ground. Because you notice that this clearly came out of a casting, but you'll notice that there are machine marks in certain specific places. Right. And as I recall, these corners were datums that we used they for the right. head That's right. Uh, yeah. into the head guide through. Because we had to control at least four of the six degrees of freedom that were critical. Right. And so the, the alignment of the head in, involved uh, shimming it in place so that you would get the uh, tracks aligned with the um, with the lower flanges, so that was repeatable. So you get repeatable d uh, data from uh, with interchange. And um, um, in one crazy moment, I had ordered this great big um, worm gear <laughs> set. And this was before I actually needed it. But I just thought, you know, I'm going to need this thing. And so one day they said, Dan, you got to set up in manufacturing with your people how to stick these into the head guide through under a manufacturing standpoint. And I said, well, I know how to do that. <coughs> so we took. We, we took the head guide through and, um, and mounted on this giant worm gear so that the people could align this under the microscope and then they were able then to use the differential screw on the skew plate to align the skew after they had this head shimmed in place and to get the penetration right. So yeah, and, and, and the a angulation of the head too, it, it might be perpendicular to the skew plate and it's perpendicular to the guys but you, you didn't want it rotated too far to the left or the right relative to the deep bearing. So you have to so set up those four degrees of freedom. And, and all Dan's talking about is just orienting this entire unit. Inside of this unit, there are two independent cylinders, a, re, a right bump and a read bump. That's right. Those yeah. cylinders are offset with respect to each other. There's a ton of microgeometry and alignment that goes into just putting those modules in here before we even give it to you to stick it in. Yeah in the machine, and I, I hope I can dig out a really cool picture of that. Because uh, Saguaro only wrote in one direction and then it rewound, we only had one set of blind, leading blind slots on each of the modules. Uh, later on, when we just did the read backward to eliminate rewind, we had to add more rows of blind slots and change this, re-optimize the geometry again. So you can tell a 3480 head from a 3490E head by saying how many rows of slots are there. Huh? And you can see that there's slots mm -hmm. on the, 
both sides of each gap of each module, and that's clearly this is a 3490 in addition to the extra cable. So now it goes back to Dan because now it's going to go to the other D bearing on its way to the take up reel and the tension transfer. Yeah, the, yeah the, the two D <coughs> bearings were identical, and as the tape left the, uh, the second D bearing heading towards the tension transducer, there is maybe 160 degrees of ramp or something. It varied depending on the, how much tape you had on the take up reel. But the idea was is to have a, a lot of ramp on this tension transducer so you get an accurate measurement of the tape tension. And the t there's a little, as I recall, a Kool-Aid pressure sensor that, um, that was centered uh, roughly where the tape would be going around the cylinder, roughly maybe an inch in diameter. And uh, the, the pressure mentioned by, measured by the sensor was uh, tape tension divided by radius and width. I got some, um, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> oh no, that's all right, yeah, you can write that note, okay. <laughs> this is, this is Joel's stuff. No, it's okay, yes, it's right. <laughs> and, parchment. Coupler, and, um, cleaner blade. The, um, head. the original tension transducer was a cantilevered member on what was called a, a, a Bendix flexural pivot. And the flexural pivot adds spring rate and the motion of the, this, uh, this cantilever beam was detected by an, a, a transformer called an E, it was an E sensor. There was a center tap and two legs and so that thing would tell as the tension transducer was pulled more or less by the tape. Well, see, as this tension tra tension transducer also had a roller bearing on it, so the roller roller bearing, the viscosity of these bearings became an issue. If it was too thin a viscosity, you saw the um, ball bearings in the tension transducer causing signal problems. Of course, if the viscosity was too high, the thing, the tape couldn't move <laughs> the roller on this tension transducer. The tension transducer was, would pivot like this and would then tend to cock and causing the tape to steer uh, inappropriately. So the idea of a mechanical tension transducer was a disaster. And so with the advent of the solid state pressure, uh, tension transducer, a lot of problems went away. That was I wanted to show a little bit of Small clarification, if you can zoom up on this, about to amplify Dan's point. So one of the things, Dan, that we did, uh -huh. the reason we took the tape back this way instead of this way, which might have been simpler on the surface, was to maintain a good wrap angle around this tension transducer. And Dan talked about how that angle can change. Well, we never know how much tape is on that take-up reel. We don't know whether we're near the end of tape or the beginning of tape or the middle of tape. So we wanted to minimize the that change in wrap angle with respect to how it affects what the tension transducer is sensing. So there was some rhyme and reason for doing what's something that looks somewhat counterintuitive on the surface. Now that high angle wrap on the tension transducer caused problems with the panel cam. The panel cam was uh, whipping. It's got, it's got a whip around there. Yeah. That's right. And so um, what we did with that was simply to slow down the panic cam as it went around here because it, it was called cracking the whip. It's like, well, how do you resign the panic cam? Well, you really can't. But in microcode, they simply slowed it down, added a couple tenths of a second to the load time, but the, we weren't uh, tearing the um, uh, leader block off the tape. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about the solid state uh, tension transducer. We went through the mechanical one, which was uh, Piezo, piezoelectric. Yeah. Yeah, piezoelectric. It was still a, a leaf spring, but the sensing was. Pie oh, the tension transducer. Yeah. No, it was a, it was a, actually used a pressure sensor uh, and, and, uh, that would be used in the pneumatic circuit, but it was a solid state pressure sensor. It, 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 there probably was a little tiny diaphragm in there somewhere. Um, and it would probably had a Wheatstone bridge with with the with the string gauge sensing circuits on it. And as the the, the diaphragm changed, it's 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 uh, like a drum head, so to speak, because of the pressure exerted by the tape on the, uh, across this air bearing, then it hmm. would pick up what the tape tension was. So it was a solid state. As opposed to this three finger mechanism. Oh, the, the, the three finger that was. The three finger mechanism was used for the mechanical tension transducer and this three finger one was a, a displacement sensor. Um, 
and it, it used it in, in uh, was essentially an electrical transformer, a differential transformer. Is the uh, is is one side got more flux, the other side got less flux. So from a electrical standpoint, the 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 E sensor made sense, but from a mechanical standpoint. It, 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 the, the, this cantilever arm of the Intrepid design was a disaster because it was steering the tape. Uh, there were viscosity problems in the roller bearing. Uh, the, the Bendix flexural pivot, no, no, dis, no discredit to Bendix, but the, that, that, the, 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 it's, as it rotated, it also changed its axial position a little bit, but see that was steering the tape again. And so we had to get away from something mechanical to detect tape tension. We also needed a decent bandwidth for what we were trying to send. Well, because right. we were mainly interested in the transients that were, a lot of those were associated with back itching. Uh, that's and, right. And uh -huh. non, what I will call non uh, steady state uh, yeah. streaming, mm -hmm. for example. I wanted to talk a little bit about more about that reel-to-reel -reel system. We, we mentioned it, but you've got these two reels. They, they always have a delta torque to maintain attention, and that's pretty predictable, knowing what the radius of the two things are, to how much but when you sped it up, you had to increase torque here and reduce torque here, but you had to maintain a torque differential to maintain tension while you were accelerating. Well, believe it or not, we accelerated so fast in 3480, much less than 3420, but still very fast because our data buffering was not infinite. No, it's pretty small. Yeah. That we would reach a point where, okay, we're trying to haul ass that way and maintain this delta torque. We would, so as we're increasing acceleration, we're increasing torque here, increasing torque. At some point, this torque that was going this way all of a sudden has to reverse and starts what appears to be pushing tape oh. out of the pack. So we called that the point of torque reversal that occurs at about 15 uh, meters per second squared, I believe it was. Um, Suara was about 40. Was it meters per second squared or inches per second squared? I forget. Uh, oh, it was 3420 was 100. Swirl was 30. We were 100 was meter per second squared. Okay, so 3420 was a lot higher than that. At any rate, when you have that torque reversal, and yesterday we talked about pack stresses, the hoop stresses, the radial stresses that are in this pack, mm -hmm. uh, different things that can cause that stress to relieve, whether it's thermal or mechanical shock, or and we talked about ISVs and all of our right. fault are all trying to fix that. Um, but one thing we didn't mention yesterday, I said the word Z-fold this morning, but there were two tape failure mechanisms since 1952 that were the bugaboos of every product that we ever shift, shifted. That torque reversal, if there is a, what we call a loose wrap in here or some place where stress has been relieved, this, the, the core, a portion of the pack might slip relative to the rest of the pack and you could actually get tape that would get smashed in the middle of the pack into what we call a Z. And it was a result of this torque reversal that occurred in combination with the stress relief of the pack. And occasionally, if you uh, happened to put the tape away with a Z fold in it, you had no way of knowing you did that. And it would sit there on a shelf for a long period of time. Eventually the tape would permanently deform in some unpredictable fashion. And you might pull that tape out and have a permanent error, which is the, uh, which is death, you know, that was a, and, and that was a failure mechanism that was with us from 1952 until 3570 when we designed a unidirectional oh. only torque capability mm -hmm. and reduced the acceleration and eliminated Z-folds for eternity. So that was a pretty cool, yeah, that, that, was, that was a pretty cool, right? that was Bagstar MP, that was the little one, the two real one. Yeah. And, uh, and because by then, data buffering was so cheap. The electronics had become so cheap that we could put a huge data buffer in there and we didn't care how long it took the tape to get repositioned and, and ready to rock and roll because we just put a big buffer in front of it. Basically think of it as a semiconductor cached tape drive right. is what tape drives evolved to. Um, the other big one was uh, something called chopped blocks. In this servo system, when we reposition the tape, to let's say a pinned data somewhere out there in tape. We kind of knew where we needed to go. The radius counts and ratios would kind of tell us where, where we were. 
and it's time to write tape, or maybe it's been stopped. We, we, the repositioning was blind repositioning. We're just hoping our servo system doesn't fail us, and we start writing data. Well, every now and then we didn't reposition far enough. We would begin appending data over the end of the last data that was there, and that's called a chopped block. You have now basically overwritten data that is irretrievable. And at some point in the future, you're attempting to read that particular block, and all of a sudden you realize it's gone. That's an even worse sin than a Z-fold because that is data loss that you didn't know and didn't report oh, to the yeah. customer. And uh, customers got nasty surprises. Later on, and again, 3570, very innovative product, uh, we had a type of a position track following a format called timing-based servo. And this was actually my idea. I'm going to take some of my horn a little bit there. We, we were able to modulate that pattern to give us a mile post all the way down the tape, just like on a highway, mile 110, mile 111, and they yeah. were about every couple of millimeters. And we had a whole new lexicon in tape. It was called LPOS, Longitudinal Position Indicator from the format. And the new lexicon was, if LPOS valid, you may write. Yeah. Um, so we never had chop box again. So okay. one of my great pleasures and one of the stories I love to tell the analysts is how, at least in my participation in the industry, during my four, ad, four orders of magnitude of participation, it turns out, of the six that tape is involved in, uh, we eradicated the two biggest uh, uh, permanent error mechanisms in, uh, in tape. And today's tape drives are unbelievably reliable. Unbelievably reliable, just all by themselves. Yeah, we thought they were also when we shipped the 3480, but uh, you did a phenomenal job. Well, that Max chart. Remember, I talked about this place where we did all this cool technology, and then we almost went out in the business right. and stuck it on the shelf. Yep. A version of that became 3590 Magstar, but that had the amplitude-based uh, track right, following servo different. because of a bogus requirement that we probably should talk about. Um. Uh, in the old days, okay, we're not quite digressing because the next thing after 3480 was 3590, and the big leap there was track following servo to get 128 tracks instead of 36. And there was a practice in the enterprise where media was expensive. Uh, you walked into a customer like Western GECO, and the first thing you saw was uh, 700,000 tape cartridges on racks, you know, at the front door. So media was expensive, so media reuse, backwards, read and write compatibility, these were important customer considerations because I want them to buy my new tape drive, but they don't want to replace 700,000 media cartridges as a consequence. So you had to protect their investment both in media and in automation if they had any, and there was a lot of other news. But one practice enterprise customers had was that rather than buy new media, they wanted to recline media. And they had old-fashioned degaussers, these large magnetic field generating, vibrating things. You stuck it in there and kind of like a microwave hit the button and you'd hear all this rattling and rolling around in there because there's magnetic stuff, you know, getting pushed through, like an MRI and you got a piece of metal in your body. You're not supposed to do that. And, uh, and that would give them two things. One, in some cases they did it to be for security. Okay, we want to make sure nobody ever reads data should this cartridge find its way into the wrong hands. But the other reason they did it was to reuse the media, re repurpose it, put it back in and it's a fresh, it's like a brand new tape. Well, guess what? You can't do that if the tape has a factory written servo format pattern on it. <laughs> when you degauss the tape, the servo goes away. So how do you mitigate the customer's concern? Well, we did all kinds of stuff that was really had done historically. We had this thing called data security arrays. It's kind of like it's kind of like reformatting a hard disk and putting all ones on it to try to obliterate what was there. But uh, but there's still always going to be a little bit of magnetic print through, and it's not anyway. It was good enough. But we had a requirement that said uh, in the event that a customer degausses their media, the drive has to be able to reestablish the servo format better. It was an amplitude-based servo pattern, and the way we wrote it on 3490 is we would take three, mod three of these mini modules and we would realign them in a certain way, and we would drive them with electronics to get the servo on there. Well, all of that that we did in the factory 
could be recreated in the drive with multiple passes oh. of writing this and then writing that and, and moving the head around. So that's how the requirement. And, uh, and it was one it was one hell of a difficult requirement to meet. It caused all kinds of compromises to the servo system, to the pattern that we were writing, to what we could and couldn't do. And at the end of the day, not one customer ever asked to be able to reform it at the tape. Mm -hmm. not one. <laughs> Did it really work? And I knew damn well no customers would ask because this was another one of those anachronistic requirements. Nobody actually was degaussing media anymore. No. They trusted data security erase, or a lot of them didn't even care. Yeah. And of course, later on came in situ encryption, which solved that problem once and for all. Uh, so in as part of that same pile of technology that I talked about that sat on the shelf gathering dust while we were deciding if we were going to stay in the business or not, uh, Almaden had come up with a timing-based servo very similar to a Chevron pattern in a disk drive. Just some disk drives had this Chevron pattern around the OD and that could act as your feed forward for your uh, repeatable run out. And, uh, much more elegant, much more robust, much more powerful concept where we could get this longitudinal position encoding in, but it was not field formatable and we didn't, by then we didn't care because we realized that it wasn't a real requirement. So the two real version of Magstar, Magstar NP, the little guy, uh, shipped with timing based servo and, and, and timing based servo is what was declared best of breed for LTO and it shipped in LTO as well and we'll talk, we'll talk about LTO tomorrow. But that was just a quick uh, fast forward for you as to. Uh, so you get the whole history. Yeah. Okay, actually. Break right time? No, uh, Alex, please. Oh, yeah. I've heard uh, you all describe very well a lot of the problems you, you had getting to work normally. And, was, and some of the things I heard made me think about what happened. Uh, did you have any unique problems if you lost power? In a customer's office, or or just in period, we lost power to everything, and but with the with the cartridge loaded, because some of the sticks and some of the things like that might occur under that. And I was wondering, did you have to address that at all? Oh yes, and I Absolutely. forget who did, but somebody came up with a, a like a little guards that would hold the tape in place if there was ever a loss of tension. It always went around uh, it was after, of course, it, the original design, but. It, this little like catchers, so to speak, around the tension transducer and the D bearings, to, to, so that if the ta you lost tape tension, the tape wouldn't fall to the deck, and then that was a major problem. It would just stay in place roughly, but with these little plastic catchers. And then there was a very special power up uh, re um, algorithm that would go through if we sensed that a cartridge was in place that. Uh, would very slowly, eventually, set the tape back on. Um, yeah, the, the test lab path. would uh, catch it. Yeah, they absolutely tested it. It was absolutely a requirement. Yeah, I assume that they probably did. I assume, yeah. <laughs> you assumed right. <laughs> well, that's usually the first thing they do. I mean, their job is to break stuff, and they're very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, I think, now covered in a great deal the tape path. I mean, from the... Well, sort of. There's one thing we left out. Thank you. Uh, that the original tape path uh, let me, here's the cartridge as you see it today. It was originally like this, so oh, to speak. Right. The leader block was on the other side. And someone said it's a left-handed tape half. And so the tape half had to be flipped all the way over. And it didn't change the design at that time. It's just a matter of dimensional flipping. And it was also about that time, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact dates, but the original drawings, like for in the Intrepid area, were all in English dimensions, and somebody finally wisely said, look, this has got to be in metric, or SI. So that happened as well. Well, somewhere along the line, somebody f messed up on a dimension, and it caused a cartridge load failure, where the, the thing would sit at an angle, I forget exactly, or maybe the, 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 the clutch wouldn't quite engage the reel. And so Joe Bullock, who sadly isn't with us anymore, but he charged Joe Dalmas and myself to go solve this problem, do whatever it takes. Well, in building of 40, there's this big test lab, a big floor, of like, and I forget exactly what it was called, but all this proof testing was going on, and they had a failure. So Joe and I go out, and we take <laughs> as much epoxy as we could find in the model shop and epoxied the drive in place, took it out and 
off the test floor and had the model shop cross-section this thing looking for the failure. Well, it turns out we never did find it. But, but did we get killed over? You took a drive out oh, of that test that. area. <laughs> 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 but eventually somebody dug around and they went through all the drawings and conversions and found where somebody, it was a transposition of two numbers or something. Well, that was I mentioned one and it might have been related because it affected the brake button function, but uh -huh. this cartridge is supposed to be one inch tall. Right. And if you measure it, it's 24.5 millimeters. And, and that could have been part of it too. And that's why the brake button would do. Oh, was maybe that must have, And yes. it might have been related to the road failure. I don't know. Yeah, but. But yeah, even today I've got one, uh, I've got some calipers at home. And uh -huh. They're still 24.5 yeah. millimeters on the, yeah. on the nose. So let's it's talk about to. the cartridge itself. That was decided in Boulder? The dimensions? The, 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 the pretty, as I recall, pretty much the, a certain amount of the cartridge was decided in Boulder, but it wasn't until we got to Tucson that Scott Graham did the, um, the idea of the clutch having a pull piece and that would interact with the brake button. So I remember that, that brake button, the spring in there and the, the, the mating, uh, the, 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 dry, the supply reel clutch with its pull piece to disengage the brake button being done when we were at the airport site. And forgive me, I don't remember exactly the date, but I'm guessing 79, 80 time mm -hmm. frame. And the uh, dimensions remained pretty much the same, except for maybe this. I think we inherited it five by four by one. Is how we inherited it. I remember that basic design. But it probably turned from one to something slightly less when right. well, somebody of that changed transition, yeah. the transition of digits. And rather than go fix a whole bunch of molds, and we had a lot of cartridges out there, we just decided to uh, uh, adjust the brake button uh, height, and that was that. And, uh, and remember how I mentioned about if you lost power that you had these little plastic guards to catch the tape and the tape back. It seems the same sort of concept here where there was um, guards around the reel so if you lost tension that the, the tape was constrained so it wouldn't travel far away from the cartridge hub. This, uh, this entire system is very ingenious. I had nothing to do with it, oh. but I've always admired it. Up here you can't see it, but there's a piece of plastic that sticks down. There's a slot in this circular member called the brake button. That's the button. Uh, there's some uh, gears that engage this thing so that when, when it, when, and there's a spring that keeps it all exploded. So you can't turn this reel yeah, that was, that without, was separa without separating that button from the actual hub. Yeah, because we tape. didn't want the customer having loose tape within the cartridge, so they had to lock the reel in place. So you have to exert significant force to push that brake button against the spring off of the reel so that that reel will spin. And, but it's a super elegant solution. It's just kind of built right into the, to the system and uh, very, very clever, uh, in my opinion. And that was intrepid? I don't know. I mean, I think it's more Akatio time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That Intrepid was more, we had a tape path that we would hand thread. There wasn't a cartridge in place at the moment, although one was being conceived. It was more of trying, the Intrepid was more just trying to get some something in the tape path to work. You could almost think of Intrepid more like a plate model. Yeah, there you go. It was not a okay. fully no, developed but in terms of function. Uh, it had, we were just trying to figure out, does this work? That's right, and it didn't. But the, it didn't. No, the notch was in the side of the cartridge from the very beginning. Um, you know, a lot of the okay, I, I un, ungenerously indicated that you know there wasn't super premeditation looking towards automation in the original. No, thought, I'm afraid there was. That, that was actually my next not, question. Not because we didn't know what it was. We had shipped it in MSS. Uh, there may have been. Uh, this was designed more for handling. The reason it's five inches by four instead of four by four is so people could grab the end of it to stick it in and out of the loader or in and out of a uh, storage slot. Um, there are stacking features in here, and I've got another cartridge so that when you stack them, they don't slide relative to each other. They make a nice, neat, perfect, so that you could grab 15 of these things and carry them to the next lab without worrying about dropping them. Uh, so there was a lot of human factors consideration that went into the design of this, but I wouldn't say there was a lot of automation forethought that was anticipated. Uh, we did do a short session on automation yesterday, and 
and basically said, go talk to STK if you want to get oh. history of that. Well, well, I do remember, well, well, just going back to the, to, to the, 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 the clutch, uh, there was a, a, a wear problem that had to be solved because you had the spinning brake button on the, on the, um, the um, tip of the, the pole piece that was uh, pushing the brake button away. And that it was something that had to be resolved, as I recall, the, just Delrin or something. but. It, it was just it another, was piece of, another piece of engineering that had to be done. And I sort of remember the f just thinking about with Joe Bullock that the, the first automation we had was like a, a magazine loader that they would stack these things in and the magazine loader would raise the cartridge up and would load and unload. Six. Pardon me? Six of them. Six of them, okay. And, um, that wasn't at time zero though, the ACL oh, no, I thought ships a couple of years later. Oh yeah, it's, it's years later, but yeah. I, I just meant from the first automation, but it was after the product was was already right. being that was shipped. called an ACL and it was really just so a tape hanger could queue up a few jobs right. and maybe you could maybe you could operate with one less tape hanger as a result or two less. So but if the when the power fails and the tape bar spinning and the button drops, does the brake We had swing? dynamic braking as I recall. There was a dynamic braking capability. Um, In the event of power loss, there was something that would break it. Uh, well, that would make sense that there, that there would be probably enough in the power supply, the, the, the capacitors, and that. Right. I think Jim Carp actually. Uh, For an orderly yeah. shutdown, so you yeah. would Or, or at least semi-orderly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that it, it, it's, it, it, they use the same thing in disk drives that if there is a power off, that, that there's enough energy in the system. Today, there, there was a time when the disk drive guys just landed, but uh, that's a, a different session. Uh, tapes well, there was a time when you had landing zones for the heads. Yeah. That power too. off, you can't necessarily get that head to the landing zone. That, that too. Right on top of it. Right? With the mother culture, remember, we know a lot about disk drives. You oh, don't yeah. know anything about tape drives. <laughs> but I'm learning. Yeah, I'm I a know. quick student sometimes. Uh, tape's always been famous for powerful motors. Right when you were uh, both uh, both for the capstan and for the thirty-four the twenty wheels. real motors were about that big around. Right, they were about that long. They were honking. But it's an interesting history you bring up because the high accelerations mandated by no buffer meant bigger motors, and so you see a gradual shrinking of motors and reduction of acceleration as the buffers got bigger. Um, Direct cause and effect, and, yeah. a, very, and a very good outcome. Particularly for LTL. Well, were the I mean the motors though of a 3480 were comparable to that of a 3420. Oh, considerably small. Considerably yeah, small. The acceleration requirement for 3480 was I I seem to recall it was two and a half times less acceleration for 3480. Yeah, and I only remember 100 meters per second, but I don't remember the two and a half. Then. But, well, I remember the ratio between. Oh, the ratio. Uh huh. The reason I remember that is because waiting years for Dan to deliver us something <laughs> that would work <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> did not enable us to do headwear testing. And I was in the tribology department, so the microgeometry of that contour was only part of my job. The other part of my job was testing uh, the life of these things because that was a big problem in 3420, head replacement. Head replacement rate was a gigantic concern on this project, oh, yeah. particularly when we found out how abrasive chrome dioxide was. And what we would have to do, since we did not have a tape deck to run wear tests on, is we would have to modify 3420s. And the modification required that we mimic the acceleration of, uh, for example, uh, back hitching in case of a start-stop uh, wear test, because just streaming wear, you know, Generally, they had so it, it's when you're starting to do all this back hitching all the way down uh, tape. There were some jobs required that to really stress the headwear. And what I remember is we had to take that cap stand on the 3420 that was uh, rubberized with holes and a vacuum in it to grip the tape, and we would have to fill the middle of that thing up with mass. Oh, because we had down. because we had no way to adjust the acceleration. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is adjust the rotational inertia of that cab stand mm -hmm. to get the acceleration we wanted. Wow, that's cool. And uh, and do our wear tests, and that's why I remembered the two and a half to uh -huh. one sure. because that was the amount of uh, rotational inertia we had to add. So so the motors were pretty much not an issue of. 
problem well, you know, coming it's funny. Uh, IBM had a history of uh, designing motors, manufacturing motors. Paul Hu has got more motor patents than mm -hmm. anybody in the universe, I think. It was before my time, but evidently there was a time when IBM made a tape drive from the casters up, way before my time. Uh, by the time we got to us, we were outsourcing a lot of commodity types of components. I don't recall that there was anything all that special about 3480 motors. They weren't this big around like 3420, they were about that big around. Right. Uh, they were still pretty long, as I it's recall. It's about the rate right length, yeah. One of them had a uh, fine tack on it, as Dan has indicated. One of them had a single tack. And the way you figured out where you were is you counted how many fine tacks went by in a single rev of the yeah. single tack. And that allowed you to, to estimate the radius of the take-up reel, the radius of the supply reel, and ultimately uh, open loop control the entire servo system for tension and velocity. It was really yeah. uh, quite elegant, actually. And the motors, at least as I recall, were made by Electrocraft, and one modification they made was to take the armature and skew it slightly so you wouldn't get into a torque hogging. If you had just a straight armature, every time you went through like a lobe in the magnetic field, it'd be thunk, thunk, thunk. So by skewing it slightly, that smoothed the transitions. Okay. So, uh, I think well, there's lots of other stuff, but I think, you know, we've really taken good advantage of Dan's time here because he uh, yeah. lived it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I actually have one of the motors at home. I can see. <laughs> I should have brought it. But there's other things, you know, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the recording channel, which was actually in the control unit in those days. Because That's right. Because we had analog interfaces, if you recall, to the actual devices. Andy could probably talk to it if he wanted to talk about it, but we've... Oh, you're bringing we talked about right recording right. head, pretty good. We mm -hmm. talked about media, pretty yeah. good. We've thrashed out deck oh. gear, pretty good. Well, but one, another well, some of the story is obviously we put pneumatics back into the 3480 tape pad. That required an air compressor, and of course the air compressor made noise, yeah. so they had to put all this foam insulation around it, which meant it heated up, and then the, beer, and the veins were wearing out. So you saw the seeds there that pneumatics were necessary to make the 3480 work, but eventually they would really have to be removed, and that's where John comes in with his LTO. Well, Maxtar, Max Star, Max Star, Max Star MP, right. and then LTO. Right. As but far then, as the 3480 channel, my recording channel, that we were going to get into. Oh, <laughs> um, well, if we want to, sure. It, it went pretty smooth. Uh, yeah, there were problems. Uh, we had the ASICs designs, we had the iterations, the design problems, the bugs, and so on, but that's normal going through. As I recall, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't ever recall the recording channel being a block for, for the progress. I mean, it didn't miss a schedule in terms of EVT or DVT or MVT. It was, uh, right. I, I, but I, I don't want to take anything away. I mean, there was a lot in the cable, a lot of noise, a lot of problems uh, that, uh, you know, signal the noise in the channel. Uh, but I don't remember, I mean, there were, sure, along the way there were tweaks, but, uh, didn't require a whole redesign. It was, like, it was like, a fairly like we went through in the tape. Uh, it was well, a fairly straightforward architecture of the channel, as I recall. It yeah. was uh, it was a peak detection channel, I believe. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it wasn't uh, the channel was one area where we were able to reuse a lot of knowledge and yeah. prior experience. That's what I was trying. To unlike say. all this other stuff. Yeah. In fact, there was remember, nothing like this tape back. Because if fact, it was, we would never make. You know, it. along <laughs> the lines of the football not going very downfield, 160 megabytes to 200 megabytes was not much of a stretch. Although we did it on a lot less tape, but the data rate only went from 1.25 uh, to three. To three. And that wasn't a big stretch either. So for, I'm not saying the channel was a no-brainer, but no, it wasn't. I, it wasn't challenged the way the mechanics were challenged. The technology the wasn't challenged. The, the unknowns weren't really. Right. Well, maybe it, writing it, 18 things in parallel is. Yeah, there yeah, was some yeah, A cross P implementation. It was the first tape drive that had a true ECC that I know of. 3420 had some weird bogus. Didn't have. Uh, didn't really have ECC. It, it, just, had, uh, it just. Hey, you got an area. It had to go parity, back and it had stuff yeah. like that. But, but Judd McDonald was a recording channel person, a, a, like site expert, and he, he was on a big poster of IBM and he said, sign your autograph your work with excellence. And so it, Judd was well thought of for his work. He's the, the guy I described yesterday that walked on water and got all the awards. Oh, there were there was <laughs> very good uh, first level management, Pete Marino, I recall, uh, Al Ramirez, Al Ramirez uh, very capable. 
that uh, you know follow track. Make sure that uh, Dave Oldham. That's another name. Yes, I mean, but very very key people that. Yeah, there were a couple of hiccups, but it sure. wasn't. Uh, wasn't the show In side. fact, we rode that relatively primitive recording channel architecture well all the way to LTO Gen yeah. 2. You're right. Wow. It was the first time we actually got with the rest of the world on PRML channels. Yeah. We were peak detection all the way to LTO right. Gen You're 2. Right. You're right. And we'll talk about it tomorrow, but HP was pushing PRML. I was trying to protect my ability to implement. Yeah. So I was not agreeing <laughs> until that was I felt like I could agree. And uh, a lot of fun LTO stories we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's a basically uh, eighteen conventional peak detectors yeah. working in parallel. Yeah, we're there was a phase lock loop yeah. across yeah. all eighteen. Yeah, there's PLO and all that. Yeah. Sure. And that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they have. But to I think that was shared information, right? That wasn't an individual channel PLO. Uh, wasn't it shared across all the tracks? I'm trying to think now. Was there one clock or was or that later? per track clock? Yeah, I, think later. I think there was one. I think there was okay. one. Yeah. As I recall, there was one. But, mm -hmm. uh, I never had nightmares about that. I was more focused on the tape deck, the cartridge, the media, the head. <laughs> well, the other thing that was interesting in the evolution of tape at IBM, it was similar to the evolution of channels and disk in that, yeah, peak detection wasn't very sexy and wasn't super high tech and wasn't PRML maximum likelihood, yeah, right. but we were more interested in digitizing the channel yeah. than we were in having the latest, greatest technology, and, and we spent far more effort converting it to what became a 100% digital channel in Coyote yeah. B or C, I don't remember which Follow version, one, yeah, when right. Bob Hutchins finally delivered the goods, yeah. and uh, the funny part is we were landing on an all-digital channel just as disk was moving away because disk had gone digital but then their performance requirements became so steep right. that they, right. a lot of disk makers actually went back to analog channels just because of the performance requirements but we stayed, got to digital and stayed on digital and we're still yeah. all digital. I mean there's analog components but it's the detection is all digital. What do you mean just by the difference between a digital channel and an analog channel? What do you, what well, in a digital channel, you, you uh, have a sampling window, you're sampling the signal, and you're applying a lot of mathematical algorithms to try to help you decide, was that a one or was that a zero? In an analog channel, you're doing it all uh, continuously. Yeah. I'm, I'm surprised you're asking me. I guess. <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to get the analog <laughs> set, you, you, you amplify it, you uh, overdrive it, Get again into a pulse, and you, then you. Uh, so, so my point was that this, the uh, speed the of the digital channel is, is limited by your ability to sample, your right. ability to do the analog to digital conversion right. of the observation, right. Right. the sample rate you have to have. There's a. There are ultimately, if speed is all you're interested in, at some point digital channels can't go fast enough. Right. That's but right. analog channels scale yeah. uh, linearly with performance, right. where digital channels mm -hmm. kind of don't. It's now, wasn't there a, a key part of the 3480 right channel where they, did, uh, was it Dave Griesel who started the double right pulse? We talked about right equal. Oh, yeah, that was right in great detail so and, uh, and what a wonderful discovery that was. Oh, yeah, it was. You downstream take, benefits. You basically One take the analog signal itself and you overdrive it, you differentiate it. And that's where your, your peak of the pulse is. And then you overdrive it, so you come up with these little pulses, okay? And, and you phase lock on those, and uh, that gives you your your signal and your timing that you need there, to there's detect There's probably the information. 50 patents in the area of variations uh, at on least, that theme, at right? Least. Now, PRML is different. Yeah. Uh, and so I, so I only pointed it out because we weren't driven by performance. Digital channels was uh, was our holy grail. Right, it was. Because now we've got a completely programmable system. I was just going to say. And we don't have to do a new ASIC every day in time. We want to take exactly. something. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but disk land went uh, was went digital for a very brief period of time, and then their single channel screaming performance requirement yeah. drove them back to analog right. to get the performance. Right. Okay. So there was no the point is there was no synergy between right. disk and tape in terms of recording. Channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, we were multi-track. They weren't. We were analog. They were digital. We were, you know, they were analog. I think Al Rizzi has another question. Yeah, I have a, a just a quick question. It, it kind of got driven by what one of the things Dan said had to do with the cables. And, and DASI having right preamps on the arms, et cetera, uh, 
What was, uh, we just had a big enough signal, we didn't need that, or was it was the reason we wouldn't put the right preamps up uh, up closer to the head? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a packaging, it's a packaging nightmare. We believe me, we, we, we thought about it. With later level technology, technology, well, technology, just technology the, but it wasn't available was at the it? time to, uh, you know, do that, that effectively. Now, when did you put it in, was it 3590? We never did. Never did? No, not even an LTO. We don't have any I electronics. I don't think so, no. Well, yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah. But we've shrunk that packaging down to That's where these true. cables are very short now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> think of it. <laughs> driving that signal from the head, it's microwaves. Well, and first of all, th this cabling, those cables. Yeah, yeah. this cabling is ancient crowbar mm -hmm. technology. Plex. Remember, we've got the multiple Wait, track, yeah. capped on. Yeah. Um, so now imagine that we're going to attempt to move this head up and down a uh -huh. fraction of a millionth of a meter, trying to track follow something written with those cables. Ain't going to happen. Yeah, no. No so in a modern tape drive, looks nothing like this. Yeah. But you know, we've only got this because this is 3480 and not LTO. And we're not even going to really talk much about LTO implementation tomorrow because most of it is still IBM confidential on the implementation. Yeah. We can talk a little bit about the consortia and how it works, but that's about it. I don't even think we can talk about the business construct okay. because I think there's elements of it that are not public domain. So are there any other areas of tape mechanisms, tape drives that uh, your disk drive interrogator has uh, le left out and you'd like to share with us? There's always memories fond and ones you want to forget, but uh, you know, 35 years ago, that's, <laughs> we just hit on the highlights, I'm sure. Maybe Dan can remember everything, but you know, gotta, <laughs> it had to impact me to remember it. <laughs> so what I've said during this whole session, the, the sessions we've had, have been the, the points that really require focus. Sure, it's uh, the high points or, or low, depending right, upon your can't perspective. Remember, can't, can't remember the, you know, the so, so things one view, that you didn't worry yeah, about. One view of the evolution of tape technology that I, I have a, a cut at it, and I actually sent a cut to the storage set once, but I don't think it saw the light of day. Is, you know, I talked about the seven odd things that were innovative going from 3420 to 3480. Yeah. There were a couple of things going to 3490E. I mentioned them. Uh, yes, I forget what they were. Yeah. I mentioned them, yeah. but I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But then we go to 3590, and that's the whole track following servo story and formatting. And one of the most significant things about track following servo and tape is now media companies needed drive maker IP to produce media. And boy, did that change the IP game um, in that space significantly, because now IBM could practically pay its development bill over the media royalties yeah. that were commanded to enable the servo writers. Servo writers. Well, you are doing your LTO stuff for free. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> our, our royalty yeah. stream just yeah. from LTO alone yeah. was yeah. bigger than our development budget yeah. when I left the business. Wow. But uh, of course, the accountants wouldn't let us view it that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dan, your perspective on your years, both as a developer and then as a licensor, can you summarize your perspective? Well, on that's that? a good that's a good point because uh, IBM had such fundamental patents for real to real technology, having the first of that product that we would go out and actively license companies to the media technology, the tridecal sterate lubricant, the, um, the, the, the tape cartridge, the leader block, the take-up reel. Uh, so there are a lot of key components that became an active uh, revenue stream for IBM regarding a patent licensing. And uh, IBM had an open policy to license people. Uh, it's not like we, some people, use patents as a monopoly. We didn't. We, we would go out and license companies and, and fair and reasonable. Uh, it, it, um, um, and, and the idea was we didn't want to alienate any companies because we, we still regarded them as partners. Even though they might need our patents in one area, uh, and you, so you get into the concept regarding these patent licenses of a balancing payment, we might need some of their patents, so we'd look at the relative royalties. But again, the whole concept of whatever we did was to maintain the business relationship. Um, 
were you in, actively involved as a light as in your licensing career with licensing of 3480 or the oh, later? Oh yes, type I got to visit my good friends at STK. Quite <laughs> <laughs> an experience. Yeah, yeah. and um, so uh, they, they they were using, and I forget what model. It was an older model of tape drive of theirs, but yeah, they were using the. Their uh, take-up reel looked remarkably like ours, with the with the with the mini doors, and they were using, of course, a leader block in their tape cartridge, and and I forget what other patents. It, but yes, so the, clearly the 3480 not only um, it was it was great working as an engineer, but it, it's a follow-on career as a patent licensing person. 3480 helped me along. Did you work with Marshall Phelps Jr.? Um, no, I don't read. No, okay. It's just uh, he he was a, co a corporate licensee person for many years. Uh, we we worked with a gal in San Jose that I think worked across tape and disc named Sophia Laskowski. That's right. Sophia was my second manager. I forgot to mention her in the... Uh, Joanne was my manager briefly for about a year, and then she, for whatever reason, had had it with patent licensing. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I remember being introduced to Sophia as uh, her... Um, powerhouse for doing proof packages of infringement. And I think that was largely due to the, all the other people had left, <laughs> along with Joanne. I was the one surviving member. Uh, <coughs> but no, it was great. Made a lot of trips to Japan, like Fuji Photofilm. And there, not only did, did we do licenses for revenue bearing, sometimes we just needed a cross license with a company, be it Tanberg Data or Fuji Photofilm. It was more like, hey, we need your patents, you need our patents, let's document this so that we can maintain a business relationship. And mm -hmm. so there was a, a certain amount of work in just tracking patents and who owns what to make sure that everything was um, on the level. Yeah, I remember traveling to Tanberg to, with Sophia to negotiate a sliver license. You may have been on that trip oh, uh, on something that impacted the actuator that we didn't feel we could design around in a timely fashion or even in a, do a better job. Tanberg, like many European companies, was very reluctant to negotiate a sliver license with us because it just wasn't in their culture, it wasn't in their business plan. They, they tended to use patents to protect their IP, not to share it. We eventually negotiated it, but only we were successful for one reason and one reason only. Uh, we were ta not only Tanberg's biggest customer, but we were approximately their only customer. No. <laughs> <laughs> we bought quarter-inch uh, cassette drives from them and qualified them for our a particular area as 400. Uh, but, series. But that was one of the nicest patent licenses. So they cooperated. License. That's right. <laughs> I was going to say that was like the best patent licensing trip I was ever on because you made the reservations well in advance. I could right. take my wife. And right. so we got to see Oslo, got to see um, the Flying Dutchman presented in Norwegian, or no, in German, but with Norwegian subtitles. But it was a grand time. Mm -hmm. Got to eat some reindeer, maybe? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, caribou <laughs> stew. Yeah, the Laplanders farm reindeer as a food source up in uh, yeah. Laplanders, meaning they go across Sweden, Norway, mm -hmm. Finland, you know, they, they're nomadic, basically. And so, Andy, do you have any summary uh, oh, marks on tape, or tape past and present? I summarized it at the beginning that uh, the job that was done was a combination of a lot of good work from a lot of good engineers, uh, a lot of technology, a lot of insight that... Uh, You've seen today from Dan and John, uh, but it all came together, and that's what gave us the 3480. Uh, without talent like this, it just doesn't happen. And, uh, we were blessed with it. And, uh, it worked out great. Uh, going through it day by day was hell, but uh, coming out the other end, it was phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, the six-year war ended successfully. That was right. it. John started with that. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. But we'd also like to remember both Fred, uh, Fred Frolic and, and Joe Bullock. <gasps> Frolic's finger. You remember it? No, but I remember his long cigars. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, you talked about that yesterday. I remember it very yeah, About the uh, sticks and keeping the, the, the tape off the head or something. Oh, I with. remember the yeah. Frolic yeah, finger. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we anyway, had a mechanic. Fred was a great guy. Yeah, and he, yeah. I summarized yesterday, so it's yeah. Okay, I think that is a wrap. And thank you so very much.